our objective is to learn more about the life form that we're studying. I'm Dr. Roger Lear, and uh, I've been doing research in the alien abduction phenomena. Myself and my surgical team has performed uh, 10 surgeries for removal of objects on individuals who allege alien abduction. And these are two specimens of which are, uh, were removed uh, during a surgical procedure, and um, they were uh, in both in the capsulated and a very dark gray membrane in which you could not cut through with a surgical blade. A laboratory was not told that they were surgical specimens. They have been likened to meteorite samples. There are numerous books and uh, videos that certainly available today that were not available years ago. We now have a, a non-profit 501c3 organization called the Aliens and Scalpel Research. And uh, we can now get grants from uh, various scientific and non-scientific sources as well as private donations to help carry on the research. And the purpose of this, of course, the net purpose, is to get the information out to the public. How difficult it would be to begin research such as this, let alone continue research such as this. So please make welcome a man who um, is as brave a man as could possibly be sitting in this room to be investigating these sorts of things, Dr. Roger Lee. Thanks, folks. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, all those that were uh, responsible uh, for getting me here, Glennis and uh, Diane and uh, Mary and so, so many others that have been so uh, kind and, and caring uh, to me uh, while I've had my uh, stay in this really great country. Now, uh, what we're going to cover today, as I said, uh, is a tremendous uh, expanse of uh, work and the things that I have done. Uh, over the past few years in relation to the alien abduction phenomena. Uh, I don't do what uh, John Mack does or Bud Hopkins does or John Carpenter or Mary Rodwell. Uh, those folks are all good folks and they're interested in a different aspect of the abduction, which is the abductee and the story of what happened to them. Uh, this is already all very important but what I'm interested in is the physical and scientific aspects of the subject. Uh, you might say I'm interested in that which you can hold in your hand, the so-called smoking gun. And I have a lot of smoking guns. So the things that I'm going to talk to you about today, it's all true, it's all real. Uh, but don't come back to me if you don't like what you hear. Go back to the scientists that have looked at these objects because all I am is in the capacity of the messenger. I am telling you what the reports say, and some of the reports are uh, printed in the back of uh, some of my books, uh, or you can uh, get it by going to my website, which is alienscalpel.com. Uh, if you want to take notes on that, very simple, alien scalpel, it's all one word with one S. Uh, the other, you can get this material through a website uh, for the National Institute for Discovery Science. Now, I didn't get into this uh, subject to, uh, to prove that this was a, uh, a reality. It was the other way around. I got uh, into the subject to disprove this and to prove that these objects uh, were nothing except some mundane things that uh, should not be in a foot. And over about the 40 years of uh, podiatric medical practice, I've removed about everything that is uh, possible probably to remove from the human body. Hair, paper, uh, nails, bits of metal, coral, wood, wh whatever. Uh, so I've, I've seen a lot of different things, but uh, honest to God, I've never seen anything like these. So. Uh, what we've done so far, as you saw in the film, we've done uh, 10 surgeries for, for the removal of objects. So far, we've removed 11 objects. 
Uh, one of these turned out to be a very expensive piece of uh, glass. Uh, and I don't mean that it was expensive to produce, I mean that it was uh, expensive to find out what it was. It was a very strange uh, piece of uh, run of glass uh, by Dow Corning uh, Glass Works uh, that used the sulfur in the glass, and the glass had both uh, characteristics of uh, crystal and glass. So it had a uh, fool for quite a while, but uh, as uh, well out, the application of applied true science uh, used in the proper manner uh, which should be used more often in this field and is not, uh, can really do something to contribute uh, knowledge to the entire world uh, with reference to the UFO subject. Now, uh, that's uh, what I try and do. And, and also, lately, uh, I've been all over the world uh, this year and for the past few years. Uh, my heart is uh, not that good anymore, so uh, next year, I'll probably be staying uh, pretty close to home, and you might not see me at, uh, at uh, conferences. But anyway, I, I want to warn you folks uh, who go to conferences or have conferences here, or listen to things on TV, or read uh, the magazines or the available UFO literature. Uh, here's my warning. Take it for uh, whatever way you want. Anyone that gets up before you that's a researcher in this field or claims they are a researcher in the field, no matter what their qualifications seem to be, if they give you the indication they have the answers, then you better put at least one finger in your ear and turn around and leave. Because we don't. And by using uh, you know, science to, as, as a tool instead of an enemy, uh, we can find out a lot of things, and that information that is gleaned from scientific <coughs> investigation belongs to every single person in this room, every th single person in the uh, state of Queensland, <coughs> Australia, and the rest of the world. It's yours, and uh, that's what I, I'm here to do. So, again, there are people that uh, walked among us that uh, try and portray the fact that uh, <coughs> excuse me, they have all the knowledge, uh, but they don't. Uh, it's okay to uh, theorize. Uh, that's uh, scientific and works uh, well. And then you must really take the theory and uh, take it into a lab and either prove it or disprove it. Now, if we could have the uh, house lights uh, down and uh, see uh, the first slide, I'm going to take you through a rather uh, rapid uh, slide presentation. And when I get uh, just about to the end, I'm going to uh, talk about another subject uh, completely, which is uh, why alien abductions occur. And again, I don't have the answer. Uh, this is my particular theory. I could be all wet. But I think uh, that I found at least one key to why most alien abductions are going on. Uh, implants, uh, that's what I do. I, I went to a person and I said, uh, gee, uh, I need a, a slide to introduce my talk. So uh, the first slide that uh, he generated for me was a slide of Stonehenge. And I said, well, gee, that's really beautiful. I think it's really nice, nice but what does it have to do with implants? <laughs> Uh, he got the idea, so I had this one made. Next, please. Well, if they're going to come here uh, from somewhere else, I guess they got to drive something. So uh, here's a, an uh, artist uh, concept of uh, what they uh, come in. It has absolutely, uh, folks, no basis in reality, but it's just a nice picture. Next. Okay, uh, this is some of the uh, instrumentation. You can see uh, we've got an instrument which is holding an object. That object has been uh, freshly removed from a nice, fresh surgical wound. Next. We'll go rather rapidly through these. This was the first object that I removed in August of 1995. It's a, a T, a letter T-shaped object. Here it looks more like a Delta Wing aircraft. But it's uh, two pieces of metal which are held so tightly together that you cannot move one upon the other, and it's wrapped in a very strange, dark, gray, shiny membrane. Now, if you remember anything of my talk uh, whatsoever, uh, when you leave today, I want you to leave with the fact that these metallic objects are covered with a very strange, 
dark gray shiny membrane, a dark gray shiny membrane that you can't cut through with a surgical blade. And believe me, uh, surgical blades uh, are very sharp. Uh, you can either sometimes uh, cut a, a bone uh, with one, uh, either inadvertently, I hope not, or uh, on purpose if you have to. So uh, this is the first object that we removed covered with this uh, membrane. Next. OK, this is uh, self-explanatory. Next. <coughs> okay, we do use uh, both color and the black and white photography. All the surgeries are uh, videoed. Uh, we have uh, live uh, witnesses there that uh, watch the surgery. We have some that watch it on television monitor. Uh, we have uh, professional writers there that will write about it. Uh, all the specimens are sealed in a container for the first uh, portion of a chain of evidence. We use the same uh, methodology as the, uh, the uh, justice system does. The containers are sealed and never open again unless the, they're opened under a video uh, camera and are signed for. Next. Uh, here's one of the little uh, cantaloupe seed shaped objects and I'm going to show you a series of these. And uh, when I say these are almost identical, I usually uh, try and mean what I say. So uh, we'll have a little test here down the line. Next. Here's uh, another one. And you can uh, compare that to the first one and say, well, gee, that is the first one. Uh, but ask yourself, uh, truly, truly, in your mind, is that the first one? Next. Here we're looking uh, at uh, x-rays. Uh, now, one of the uh, criteria that we have set up for surgical candidates is they must have a demonstrable object which appears on an x-ray, a CAT scan, or an MRI. Now, I, I've run about uh, 300 emails uh, behind, so if you uh, email me and you don't get an answer right away, I apologize, just uh, hang on. Uh, we'll eventually get back to you. Now, a lot of people think they have implants, uh, but they don't. They may have uh, objects uh, other than implants in them, or some are tumors or other uh, natural growths uh, that appear on the human body. Next. Uh, here's an object right here, and you can see that it's uh, above the bone. Most of these objects we find are down deep. They're within the close uh, proximity to the bone. Uh, but not touching the bone. They're in an area where the tissue has uh, not reacted with an inflammatory response. Very strange. How do you get a foreign object into the body and not have it react? Uh, we feel that uh, one of the reasons for this is that uh, these uh, metallic objects are covered with a very dark, gray, shiny membrane. Good. Uh, and uh, as I said, you can't cut through it with a surgical blade. But anyway, we think that this might be the reason uh, why the body doesn't react with either a rejection or an inflammatory reaction. So if we could raise enough funds or get some outside interest without them uh, stealing everything, uh, and we could reproduce this membrane, you can see it would be kind of a contribution of kind to medical science. Because you could wrap a pin, a screw, a nail, a plate, uh, a heart, a liver, a kidney, or whatever else, and the person would not have to spend the rest of their lives taking immunosuppressive agents such as uh, cyclosporin or Imuran or some of those. I'm not saying that the drug companies would be totally happy, but there'd be a lot of happy people around. Uh, this is the same object, and uh, when you look at an x-ray and you uh, turn the part that you're x-raying in in various angles, you can see that uh, here it looks the closer proximity to the bone. Also, you can see some interesting shape to it. Uh, now, this gentleman came from a small town in uh, Colorado, Yuma, Colorado. Uh, he had one experience about uh, 17 years before he contacted me with his wife. 
They were driving down the street uh, late at night, coming back from Denver to eastern Colorado. It was about 11.30 at night, uh, no moon, dark, desolate area, and saw a light behind them uh, driving a truck. His wife is a registered nurse, very qualified observer. He said to her, oh, is that a truck behind us or what? And she said, hmm, I think it's an R what? because I think it's flying, and it, uh, <laughs> it caught up to them and uh, started paralleling the uh, truck coming over the uh, tree area until they got to a clearing, and uh, Tim then uh, slowed down, came to a stop, and at that point, uh, this uh, flying object crossed the road in front of them and uh, came to a halt out in a parallel field to the left side of the truck. <coughs> The, uh, the driver, Tim, uh, looked at it and uh, turned to his wife and uh, they both looked at each other uh, rather quizzically and uh, he said that he had an urge to uh, get out and find out what this was. Well, uh, that's the last thing he remembers. Uh, at, no, not, not quite. There's one more part. He saw a light come on. Actually, one light right on top of the other. It uh, filled the cab of the truck with this very brilliant uh, bluish white light and then and the next thing he remembers both hands are on the steering wheel he turns to his wife and said well I think we should go to town now dear so they did they uh, proceeded on home and uh, when they got there uh, things just didn't seem right because uh, three hours were missing now, uh, strangely enough, because the guy is a, a cement contractor and because he had three young daughters that were going to school and they lived in a very small farming town, uh, he didn't want the word to get out that he saw something weird, you know. So uh, they didn't tell anybody. Nobody. Not the rest of the family, the neighbors, the church, nobody. And then uh, one day, about 17 years later, he uh, smacked himself on the, hand, on the thumb with a, with a hammer. And uh, he thought, well, gee, maybe I broke my thumb. So he went to the hospital, local hospital and had an x-ray taken. Uh, the doctor saw this in his arm and he said, no, that's impossible. I, you know, I've never had anything like that to happen. I can't have anything in there. And the doctor said, yeah, well, Tim, uh, there it is. You got it. Fortunately, your thumb was not broken. So he began to think about it, and uh, something clicked in his mind, and he related that immediately to the experience that he had uh, so many years ago. And uh, it was after that that um, he was able to contact me. He seemed like a very compliant person. Sent me the x-rays. Uh, we showed it to our radiological consult. And it came to the conclusion that there was uh, a foreign, what appeared to be metallic foreign body uh, in the wrist area. And so we invited him if he so wished. And we don't do this on anybody unless they wish to have it done. Also, uh, another portion of the criteria is they must have some kind of distress, either physiological or psychological distress. Uh, we don't go on fishing expeditions in people's bodies looking for uh, foreign objects where nobody is being bothered by it. So they have to have, uh, as I said, a, a connection to some kind of a UFO event, conscious memory, abduction. We don't want anybody to have undergone retro or a regressive hypnosis uh, prior to the time when we do the surgery. Uh, why? Simple. We don't want the criticism. We don't want to be accused of uh, putting uh, false memories into somebody's head. So uh, afterwards, once the surgery is done, if they wish to uh, have their memory enhanced and uh, they want to undergo regressive hypnosis, we supply them uh, with an individual such as the ones I mentioned, uh, Bud Hopkins and so on, and um, they get it done and then uh, we record uh, that en enhanced memory as uh, part of their file. But as I said, I'm not uh, here to, uh, to look at uh, UFO abduction stories. I think they're all fascinating. I think they're all tremendously interesting, but it's uh, this kind of stuff I'm interested in, physical evidence. Next. Okay, uh, when I first started doing these surgeries, uh, we did the first procedure in an office uh, with a general surgeon assistant and a number of other people there, but we didn't have any time-saving devices. Uh, now we do, uh, this is uh, called a C-arm, and uh, 
These cost about $1,500 a day to rent, so you can see these uh, surgical procedures are not cheap. Uh, yet we don't charge the individuals a penny for any of this work. Uh, we pay for their medication, we pay for their post-op care examinations and laboratory. All they have to do is qualify and get themselves to us. We, we don't go to them. Next. This uh, CR device uh, will, we can use to uh, actually look through the part where the object is and then the uh, surgery uh, procedure is recorded on these two uh, television screens. This is an instrument here and uh, you can see it approaching the object. You can see it when it clamps the, the object and we bring it forth so it's uh, visualized and then uh, dissect it free from the surrounding tissue. Also, when we've sent these in for an analysis, as I told you, that there is no evidence of inflammation, but what I didn't tell you is that the tissue is loaded with a certain type of nerve endings called proprioceptors, which are not politically or anatomically correct for the area. <coughs> Next. Also, you can see Tim is uh, laying on the table there. Uh, we only use a local anesthetic. We don't use general. Uh, we have used the hypnosis in a couple of cases because the patient was quite apprehensive, and so we didn't want him to feel any pain, so we did use a local anesthetic and a hypnoanesthesia. Next. Uh, this is the object that uh, we removed from Tim, and we have before these that looked, uh, as I say, almost exactly the same. We call them little cantaloupe seed-shaped objects, and they are metal rods, uh, a few millimeters in length by a few millimeters in width, uh, very similar to sometimes a very uh, thick uh, lead pencil, lead type uh, piece. And they are covered with this very strange, dark, gray, shiny, biological membrane. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Uh, there it is on a surgical sponge. This is not the kind of sponges, you know, you get off the bottom of the ocean. These are God's pads. Uh, before I uh, started doing any of this, I researched the literature and I uh, wanted to make sure that the objects were safe in the first place after we took them out because there had been a few people before me that, that supposedly removed objects except nobody came up with anything. All there was was talk about, oh, it turned to vapor, turned to powder, Dropped on the floor, my dog ate it. You know, just all sorts of things, but nobody really came out with any. So I wanted to be safe, so I thought, uh, gee, what, uh, what is a good thing to preserve these uh, objects in? So I thought, well, maybe a piece of the person that it came out of would be a good thing. And uh, what's an easy thing to get uh, from the body that we could use? Hey, how about blood? So uh, we took blood and we uh, spun it down, took off the liquid portion, which is the serum, and uh, that with a preservative and an anticoagulant made a wonderful uh, transport and preservative medium, uh, medium to uh, put these objects in and uh, ever since then they've been as happy as clams. <laughs> Next. Another view. Yeah. Next. 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 Is this the same one? Or maybe that it was the same as the first ones I showed you. Next. Next. Hey, how about this one? Is that the same one as the other one? Yeah. Let's take a poll. How many think all of these are the same one? Nobody. How many? Oh, we have one person. How many people think they're all different? Oh, you're partially right. Next. How about that one? Is that the same as the one we just saw? How many say that's the same as the one we just saw? One person. Next. Okay, well, you're all wrong because they're, uh, some were the same and some were different, but they all, as I said, I don't use terms loosely, they look pretty much exactly the same. Coming, they came out of four different individuals. Now, that means something. What does it mean, you say? I don't know. It means something. <laughs> Draw your own conclusion. 
Anyway, uh, what do these things look like when you look at them through the microscope? Here we're looking at uh, the object through a small uh, dissecting microscope, and you say, ah, that's not the object. He probably went to the butcher shop and got some liver. But uh, no, it's not liver. Uh, that's what the membrane looks like underneath the microscope. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when uh, we were using uh, magnification uh, techniques such as the atomic force microscope, we found that we couldn't keep these objects in serum <coughs> because uh, serum uh, has an occasional uh, blood cell in it. And you can just imagine if you were looking under great magnification and here come this you know, giant blood cell <laughs> swimming by, you, you wouldn't see what was underneath. So uh, we found that we could uh, take them out and put them in uh, sterile distilled water. Uh, let me show you what happens next. This is another shot, just come out of the serum. You can see it's very smooth and shiny. Next. Aha! Uh -huh. What happens when you put it in sterile distilled water? The color begins to fade out. It gets this whitish color. And in this portion, you can see through it. And what you're seeing is the metal that's inside. And not only that, but the membrane becomes soft, and you can cut through it. Next. <laughs> Here's a, uh, a greater a close-up view of the area where you're actually seeing the uh, metal uh, right through the membrane where it became transparent. Next. Ah, we discovered something else. On one of these specimens, actually we have two, three now, three specimens that have this little area and uh, these look like little egg sacs. What a strange thing to find. Next. Again, these little sacs. What would that be doing on a membrane wrapped around a piece of metal material that came from the inside of the body? Next. Again, you can see these. Can everybody see these okay? Okay, we had uh, the uh, a French, uh, a little French biologist uh, who had a PhD in biology and she was also a physician. And uh, she said uh, something like, uh, and pardon if I don't do this correctly, but she said something like, uh, this is the strangest thing I have seen come from the human body. <laughs> and uh, you'll see pictures of her. She's kind of a cute gal. But we had another uh, uh, scientist lady who came along and said, I'll tell you what, I'll uh, donate a microtome blade. Uh, you, you all know what a microtome is? It's like a meat slicer, you know, it slices up deli and stuff. Uh, but what you do is you take your specimen and you freeze it in a block. And then uh, when it's frozen in this block, you can put it on this microtome slicer and you can slice through the frozen material and it makes very fine slices that you can then put under a microscope and you can look at it. So, uh, and these blades are extremely expensive. So this uh, one scientist said, uh, I'll tell you what, she says, I'll donate a microtome blade if I have your permission to take a piece of this off and slice it up and look at it under a microscope. And I said, well, darling, you got it. So uh, that's exactly what we did next. And here the uh, material is being sliced off. Egg sex, next. And here we begin to see uh, what it looks like as it, as it comes off, next. And uh, this, uh, changing horses uh, for a minute, this is the uh, object again. Uh, this is the metal that's inside, and then the, the membrane has been uh, totally removed. And as I said, uh, we found that when it became soft, you could uh, totally uh, separate it from the metal. Except when you look at it uh, through even higher magnification on a uh, scanning electron microscope, <laughs> where you can see part of this membranous organic tissue has uh, been anchored into uh, the metal. Next. 
Now the way that we get the, the uh, outer coating off is to use an abrasive material. It's kind of like sandpaper, except it's in a liquid slush form. And uh, it's abraded across here. And inside, you'll see there's a very shiny metal. Thanks. More of the same. Next. See how shiny this uh, metal is inside? This outer coating is around here. Next. Now also you can see these abrasion marks. These are not normal. This is not part of it. This is where the area has been uh, abraded or sanded, so to speak. And this is what it looks like under magnification. Next. Next. Now, this is when you cut through these sacks and it's on water, some stuff comes floating out. And uh, guess what that stuff is that's inside these sacks? Anybody want to take a stab? Guess? Looks like strange gray. <laughs> yeah, the guy is a good learner, but no, you're wrong, sir. Anybody else? What do you got to lose? Take a guess. Blood? No, not blood. Yes. Yes. Mucus. No. 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 I'll tell you. It's oil. Ah. Oil. Yep. <laughs> Standard oil found out about this, and I'm dead. <laughs> no. It's, it's oil. And uh, what a strange thing to be found in sacks attached to a membrane that surrounds a piece of metal that has been taken out of the human body where there's no scar for it wherever it was put in. <clears throat> High strangeness. Next. Next. Now the oil droplets uh, were on the, on the water with uh, higher magnification. You can see that here. Now, what is this oil? You know, what kind of oil is this? Well, I was uh, had the privilege of having this analyzed at a black budget laboratory in uh, Texas. <laughs> and uh, the guys were very interested in this kind of stuff, but the lab director was kind of ticked because he stood out in the hall like this, and uh, all these uh, scientists who were on the payroll to do uh, black budget work for the uh, uh, military and, and the U.S. government are in this little room, crowded around this stuff, looking at my stuff. So it doesn't make the laboratory director happy. <laughs> but we, we did uh, subject this oil to a test called uh, Raman spectrometry, and we found out all the uh, acids or the amino acids that are in this oil, and fatty acids. But uh, what do you know? It didn't fit anything in the database. And the database has about 153,000 oils in it. So uh, here we are, right back to where we were before, and as I said, uh, or I might have said before, many times you do these tests or you use science to answer questions, and what do you get? Plenty more questions. So uh, that's why I don't have all the answers, and uh, if I stay alive and keep uh, pursuing this, maybe sometime down the line uh, you'll have me back someday and I can answer these questions. Next. Uh, using a scanning electron microscope, uh, the amount of the kV, this is a 20 kV, is the force of the electron beam which is going into the object. So uh, here we're looking uh, basically at the surface and you'll see these uh, strands come off and these uh, strands that come off are biological tissue that have been uh, anchored into the metal itself. We have no known uh, human technology for doing this. Thanks. Uh, this is, uh, these are just some uh, slides of uh, some of the laboratory equipment that's uh, being used. Next. Next. Let's see, yeah, good, we'll focus on that. And uh, this is the gal I was talking about, and uh, she's a very uh, brilliant lady. Next. 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 That won't focus because it's a picture of a picture. <laughs> Next. Okay, now uh, we're going to stop uh, with the slides right there.
and um, I'm going to uh, show you uh, a short video of uh, one of the procedures that we did uh, with the object that was removed from Tim Cullen. He's the fellow you saw laying on the table. Uh, he's the uh, fellow with one of these little cantaloupe seed shaped devices. He's the case I talked about uh, from Colorado. Now this guy was, uh, was uh, very uh, interesting because he was mad. He was sort of a, a simple, you know, hillbilly type a uh, person who represented uh, a very large brain. But he was mad because he said, nobody had the right to do this to me. I don't care whether they came 10 trillion miles through space or they didn't have my permission. Uh, they didn't have my permission to put this in my arm. So he was mad and uh, after the surgery was done, uh, he went back to the small town in Yuma and he went to two churches. One was the Catholic Church and another was the Lutheran Church. And he presented this material on two different sun Sundays. He did a, a public uh, presentation to the congregation. And he was extremely well received. And uh, it got into the small 128-year-old uh, newspaper, the Yuma Pioneer. And that was uh, uh, a front page story that was uh, picked up by the Denver Post, which is a very uh, conservative newspaper. And they printed a small one-page article. So that's the kind of guy uh, he is. Now I'm going to show you what his objects, uh, his object looked like uh, when we uh, put it uh, on the bench and we use uh, magnetic. Remember, these objects are highly magnetic uh, to begin with, but we'll put a magnet over it and I'll show you uh, what it looks like. So go ahead and run that uh, video number two. Here's the object and see how nicely it, it flies up to the magnets. It goes quite a distance. Now we'll take it back out again and uh, we'll put it on the lab table past the magnet uh, over at a particular distance. What you're going to see is these two little things. I hope you can see it from the back of the room. Two little things come out, like two little antenna, and uh, when they move the magnet back and forth, they wave back and forth with the object. Hello, magnet. Hello, hello. Isn't that kind of a cutie? Now well, that's the one that came out of uh, Tim's arm. Now, I, yeah, it will uh, it will jump right up. We have one, I think, in slow motion here. Hey, bingo! Hello. So uh, we took this object uh, to uh, the same uh, black budget laboratory in Texas, and uh, they uh, did the uh, scanning electron microscopy. And uh, you can kill that now. And what uh, they found was, you know, if it's highly magnetic, you would think that it would contain what? Iron. Iron, right. Well, it did. High, very high concentration of iron. So then we did another test on it called an x-ray diffraction examination. Does there anybody know what that is? No one? Okay, uh, x-ray diffraction looks at the uh, molecular structure of a particular metal, and um, all metals uh, are structured uh, um, uh, with um, uh, a, a, an arrangement uh, of atoms, uh, an arrangement of molecules, and they form uh, a crystal. So uh, every uh, pure metal is a crystal, and that's uh, the way metals are supposed to be, and that's the way they are found in nature. Now, if uh, somehow you look at the metal and you don't find any arrangement of atoms, that metal is then called amorphous, amorphous. Morph meaning form, a means without. Uh, so these are, this is a metal without form. So here we have a high concentration of amorphous iron. Well, you don't find uh, amorphous iron in nature. And I thought you just didn't find amorphous iron anywhere. But uh, being a black uh, budget laboratory, do you all know what I mean when I say black budget? Yes. Yeah, okay. You should. If you're, if you're here, you should know what black budget is. $98 billion, uh, was last year's U.S.'s black budget. Uh, money that's totally unaccounted for, as a side note. But anyway, uh, they look at this, and uh, I, I found out that, uh, hey, guess what? We know how to make amorphous metals. 
Uh, don't ask me uh, what we use it for, <laughs> because I haven't a clue and they weren't going to tell me. But there was a concession. That they even told me that we know how to make it. But uh, one of the things uh, we don't know how to make, and so if a black budget laboratory doesn't know how to make it, then it's not uh, in the purview of uh, the field of science. We don't know how to make it magnetic. So here again, they're all crowded in here, this little room, looking at this uh, magnetic iron, which is amorphous. And again, the lab director's out in the hall with his hands on his hips because these are getting these guys are getting paid to do this secret stuff, not be in there looking at UFO material. So uh, you know, you can you can catch a certain uh, you know, things uh, about this. So anyway, that's uh, one of the things uh, that we find and. Uh, uh, it's just uh, one of the uh, mysteries, again, you know, why do these have uh, amorphous metals? Why are they magnetic? Uh, I often get uh, asked, uh, what happens, uh, you know, in the body? Uh, can you detect anything? Are they putting anything out? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we found in several cases that they put out an electromagnetic field measurable on a Gauss meter of about six milligauss. And if anybody's in the electronics or radio, you'll know that's a pretty, pretty strong uh, magnetic field. Uh, when they're taken out of the body, they don't do anything. Also on an instrument called a trimeter, we get a mid-range reading on a combined scale, electrical scale and magnetic scale. And uh, that's also a pretty strong reading. We have uh, an electrical engineer that we've used, and he has uh, designed a special a probe that's connected with an oscilloscope so we can read the wave and see what it looks like. And he says there's a good indication uh, that there's something going in and there's something coming out. So uh, obviously these uh, objects are in communication with uh, somebody at some distance. Uh, and before you ask the question, are these locator devices? Uh, in my opinion, that's nonsense. Because um, for uh, two primary reasons, if we're dealing with uh, an intelligent uh, critter from elsewhere, extraterrestrial, extra-dimensional, time traveler, or all of the above, I don't think their technology requires uh, some kind of instrument to tell them that they're going to be able to track a being. And we know now enough um, uh, about DNA to suspect that, uh, is Bill Chalker still here? Yeah, Bill's here, uh, you know, he's probably the one that's uh, better on this than I am, but we know there's a good possibility that DNA contains its own uh, sub-electrical signature. And so if you're an advanced culture and you've got the instrumentation, uh, you don't need devices to track uh, beams, you can track them all over the world. Uh, that coupled with the fact that I have a case uh, in Brazil uh, where a lady has an object in her foot very similar to what we had in the first case, and uh, no, she does not want them removed. They scared her to death because they took an insect and they made it uh, stand still in midair in a small pencil-like beam of light. And they told her that they could find this insect uh, anywhere on the planet that it went. So that convinced her that uh, she shouldn't have these objects removed. So anyway, I want to uh, leap on and I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, the last case that we did. Uh, which is a case of what seemingly is a biological object. Uh, the lady is a professional airline stewardess, uh, still flying. Uh, she had one episode which occurred uh, many years ago, about 20 years ago, before she contacted me. She was um, uh, sleeping with her uh, intended. Uh, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. She saw a strong light come through the window. A uh, nice big bluish white light and she tried to wake her boyfriend up, he wouldn't uh, wake up. So she got up, went to the window, she says, and looked outside. She saw a circular hovering craft. What would you expect, a streetcar? And uh, we saw the circular uh, hovering craft out there and uh, that's where the light was coming from. And I said, well, what happened after that? Remember, this is all conscious memory, no hypnosis. And she said, uh, I don't know. I said, well, what do you mean you don't know? So I, I guess I went back to bed. And I said, well, you think you went back to bed? Yes, yeah. I guess I must have went back to bed because the next thing I knew it was morning. And I woke up and I was getting up and uh, my friend was gone. I never saw him again. So uh, they didn't communicate after that. 
So anyway, she woke up and she had all the uh, feelings of uh, the flu. She said she had muscle aches, pains, her eyes were burning, watering, her mouth tasted like uh, cotton candy and snake oil mixed together. And uh, she didn't uh, feel very good, so she went uh, into the bathroom and she sloshed some water on her face and she was extremely thirsty, so she started gobbling the water down. She said, oh God, I'm going back to bed. So she went back to bed, uh, got up later, went in, took a shower, and as she was taking her shower, she looked at her arm and saw a lump. She said, oh my God, I grew a lump. Overnight, I grew a lump. Isn't that neat? And so she reached down with her finger to touch it, and the lump moved. And she fairly well freaked out, almost passed out in the shower. Not good. So uh, again, she went back to bed and she uh, rationalized this around as uh, something. It was a tumor, it was a cyst. She didn't know how it got there. There was no scar, no nothing. And worse than that, but she didn't tell her family. She didn't tell her friends. She didn't tell anybody again about this experience. And went on all those years until she had a friend who uh, took her to a talk that I was giving in the uh, eastern United States. Uh, she went in, she said, and she listened to me for about 15 minutes, got sick and left. And she couldn't take it any longer. Didn't know why. And then it took her uh, three years after that, she finally contacted me and she basically lived about 20 minutes away. Uh, got a hold of me uh, by telephone. I talked to her on the phone. I heard her story and I said, oops, <laughs> I don't think I want this gal in my office. She's got a problem and I don't think it's an implant. <laughs> you know, I was going to refer her to a uh, psychiatrist for psychiatric treatment. And uh, she insisted that uh, it was real and so on. And so she convinced me to take a look at her. So she made an appointment. She showed up. And I asked her a few questions, and uh, as I usually do with these cases, gave her the benefit of the doubt, took her in the room, and said, uh, okay, let's see it. And so she rolled up her sleeve, and there was the lump. And uh, immediately said, oh, you know, she's got a nice subcutaneous cyst. So uh, I took my finger to go ahead and palpate the, the cyst, and it moved. And I said, oh my. <laughs> Uh, something is not right here, but I'm telling you the way uh, a medical mind works. I said to myself, what happened here was that at some time or another, another this uh, woman must have gotten a subcutaneous infection. And sometimes when you get an infection, the bacteria will produce, you know, pus and stuff. And so it will make a, a tract underneath the skin, underneath the subcutaneous tissue that's called a sinus tract. And then sometimes some of it will come out and it will drain and you're still left with this tract. So here's what it's doing. You touch it here and it just moves through this little sinus tract until it gets to the end. So in order to prove that, all I have to do is put one finger here, where it started from, another finger on the object again, and naturally it's going to move right back to where it went because it's moving in this tunnel, in this canal, in this track. That's how the mind works. So I put one finger here, I put the other finger on the object, and it went whoop, <laughs> in another direction. Now you say, usually you think, well, maybe that's a clue as to something is strange. Not me. She must have two sinus tracts. And by God, I got three fingers. So I put one here, I put one there, I put one there. And I touched it again, and it went whoop. Ran out of fingers. It would move anywhere within a circle of about two and a half inches. Now, uh, if that wasn't bad enough, you know, when I started playing with it, and uh, really, you know, I, at that time it had been in practice uh, for about 37 years, and I'd seen a lot of things, this was beginning to freak me out, folks. I put my finger close by the object, and it would come to my finger, like, donkey, and it would follow my finger around her arm. You know, great thing, I guess you could sit there and play with that all day, as she had done for uh, many years. But, uh, you know, was it causing any pain? No, but it was certainly causing her a lot of psychological distress. And if I, if I had the time, uh, which I don't, to tell you 
the strange set of synchronicities that allowed us to operate on this gal, you would be as freaked out. October the 29th, 2001. This is the patient. That must be my name. And there it is, folks. Now, if you can't see this, then you better go to your ocular specialist. Close up. Hello. Take me out for a walk. Mm, come, come, come. Now, uh, this is for the purpose of uh, withdrawing uh, blood so that we can spin it down and put the object in it, and use the serum. Same preparation for all these cases. Now, what you're going to see here, if you're not used to looking at surgery, most objects, uh, when you remove them, you've got to uh, dissect them free because they're attached to the surrounding tissue. Uh, when you see this thing uh, come close to the surface, uh, you'll see that all he does is reach in uh, with an instrument, uh, clamp it, and take it out without any resistance. Also, uh, it was kind of sneaky because uh, we had to hold it to to get the thing to come to Papa. <laughs> it didn't want to come. See, two fingers on either side. <laughs> That's to prevent it from moving. Ah, we're going to get you. There we go. See, no resistance whatsoever. comes right out. And uh, it's about as big as a large pea. It's yellowish in color, very smooth, and it's a bivalve. It's in two sections connected in the middle uh, like a clam. And uh, on either upper end, you might say, it has a dark line. We don't know whether that's something metallic or uh, whether that's totally biological, too. Uh, too. Now, uh, the only test that we've done on this so far is uh, some very uh, superficial uh, testing, and uh, that superficial testing has um, t told us that the uh, surface is a very smooth cellular-like uh, structure uh, with well-connected cells. There's the wound that's uh, closed up, gets a little uh, patch over it, and the uh, patient went on the following day uh, for a flight, and uh, she got along very well. We're going to take the object now and uh, place it uh, into the container of uh, serum. Uh, we'll then uh, close it up, put a label on it. The label will be signed, sealed, and the next time it will be opened, it will go through uh, another visual process and signing process and so on. That's called a chain of custody or chain of evidence. Okay, if we can uh, chop that off right now, we'll uh, go on to the next subject so I can uh, I hope quickly uh, conclude. Now, uh, what is it then if this is uh, all going on all over the world? What could possibly be happening? And as again, I said this is my theory, uh, but I think others uh, have listened to it, and I really haven't had many arguments. Now, this may not be the only reason for the abduction program, but I think it's one, and I think it's a valuable one. I believe that the human race worldwide is being and has been, for some years now, undergoing a genetic manipulation. And I think this is evidenced by the children that are being born within the last 40, 50, or 60 years. They are not the same children, they are not the same humans as myself or somebody that's older. And this is evidenced in many different ways because a lot of different people and you're going to hear a lot about it from Dr. Richard Boylan. He's going to be talking about the star kids. 
And there's been numerous names, star children, millennium children, indigo children, advanced children. Uh, we don't know why, but I've had uh, discussions on this subject uh, virtually uh, all over the world. I've never had an argument from a mother, a grandmother, a grandfather. They don't argue with me because it's true. The children are different. They can not only do things uh, at early ages, but they also have uh, abilities that are far beyond what we used to be able to do. And some of us right now sitting here in this audience that are in this category can probably do these things, but they don't even know that they have the uh, ability to do them. Now, I wanted to find out, well, you know, is there something that's measurable here? If this is really the case, can we measure this somehow? And so I came to the conclusion that uh, there is a possible way. So what I did was I took 17 <laughs> functional growth characteristics and I measured them over a period of 40 years, from 1947 to 1987. And I did not choose 1947 because it was the year of Roswell. I used 1947 because it just happened to be that the books on these childhood development statistics were written in 1947 and were never changed from 47 to 61. Isn't that strange? All over the world, and these, the people that do this, are statisticians. They're not doctors, they're statisticians. So we look at the thing as the age of running, the age when a child sits up, when they can sit freely by themselves, the age of weight bearing, the age of running, the age of speech, and so on. And so I compared them over the 40 year period, 1947 to 1987. And why 1987? Because that's the next upgrade in the statistical literature was 1987. Was this an easy test? No. Let me tell you why. Because we didn't measure the same things in 1947 that we measured in 1987. There are hundreds of different things that have been measured all those years. Did you know that today, as a uh, result of some uh, interesting research, we measure, measure the age of patty cake, when kids can play patty cake. And guess who else? plays patty cake as a training measure. Anybody know? Astronaut training. The astronauts are instructed to play patty cake. They're in a sealed chamber and they reduce the oxygen pressure. Until the oxygen pressure is getting there, all they're doing is playing patty cake and they're watching their responses as the oxygen tension goes down because this is a, uh, a thing that you can measure not only eye coordination, but it's muscle coordination and movement coordination. A lot of different uh, neurological <laughs> factors come into play. But did they measure patty cake in 1947? Nope. So I had to find things that were, this, that were measurable for, for both cases. So I did, I found 17 different characteristics that we were able to measure. And out of all these characteristics, uh, all of the 17, we found uh, one of those that also sticks out uh, as a very interesting factor. And I'm gonna show you uh, these uh, statistics uh, in slide format, and uh, we'll run through uh, some of them very quickly because they're boring, but we'll go almost <coughs> directly to the graphs, and we'll look at the graphs and uh, you, you, you'll see this, and uh, just think about it. So, could we show those uh, slides now, please? Yeah. Get to the other graphs. Here's the graph, sits with propping. I mean, look at the difference. The acceleration rate here is from 16 to 80%. Sits with propping, look at there. Look at the difference. Look at this. The, this makes it very apparent. Go ahead, functional activities. Next. Okay, T take a look at these. 16.67%, 66.67, 33, 80% obeys commands, 80% accelerated change. Next. Graphed out, you can see it. Next. Complex sentences, attempts to stand, bear weight, 62.50% accelerated change. Age of walking. 38.89%. Look at this. Runs well. 24 months and 
24 months. Zero percent change. Now, if that isn't an indication that this is a specific genetic manipulation, then I don't know what is. Next. Okay, if we could focus that a little bit better. Uh, here are some of the uh, raw statistics. Uh, and as I said, I'm not going to take the time to uh, go through all these because we have some graphs that illustrate it better. So let's just go on by these and just go by slowly. You don't have to go that fast. Look, look, look. Sorry, I'll go back. That's all right. Just, uh, for this. Can you see those from and back? If you can read one or two a page, well, that's all you need just to get the, the general idea. Next. <laughs> Next. Take a chance. <laughs> it's the switch. Okay. It's the switch. Don't touch the switch. <laughs> Hops on one foot. Next. Next. Here's a, a, a book that was written in, uh, is this the one, 1961? It was updated in 61, but it originally came out in 47. So between 47 and 61, there was no change in these figures. And you can uh, see what things were like in 1947. Some are rather unbelievable. Poles and stands, 12 months, 6 months, turns head. Go ahead. Next. <coughs> 48 months is able to count for pennies. Swallows from glass, 18 months. Are we talking about today, kid? Do you see any change here? Just wait. Next. Nose right from left. 72 months. Why, if your kid didn't know that today, in a lot less time, you'd say, oh, I think there's something wrong. 60 months, five years, to name colors. Here's some more additional statistics. Six months attempts to crawl. Six months. My babies crawl an A, I think the minute you let them go. Next. Now, uh, take a look at this one. I, I want you to remember this. This was 1947. At 24 months is when a child runs. Okay, we'll be right on time. Okay, next. Here's a question you can ask. Uh, how soon after birth do you think your child was able to see normally? In the 1940s and 30s and 40s, the ophthalmologist told you, well, don't get up too close uh, because you're going to confuse them. They can't see, they can't focus, they can only see color, they can only see gray, they can't see color. And uh, now I don't think there's any, any question. Next. Now, uh, here's a couple of uh, examples. I've had uh, people write letters. Uh, do I have time to read one letter? Okay. I'll take my glasses off. Uh, dear Dr. Lear, I'm writing this letter to you concerning my daughter Angela Marie Christine, who is the youngest of my three children. She was born on November the 27th, 1974 in Ventura, California. In many ways, she has always been an exceptional child. When she was two and a half years old, I told her it was time to start potty training for her. Her reply to me was, I'll do it myself. And she did. 
<laughs> However, the ways I believe her to be exceptional have nothing to do with potty training. From a very early age, as soon as she could hold a crayon, about two years old, she has exhibited an incredible artistic ability. I've enclosed some of the pictures of her paintings that were done at age 13 and 14, along with her artistic ability she has exhibited, also at an early age. The ability to be very sensitive and empathetic to people's feelings. When she was in grade school, she would often tell me that she was afraid of hurting someone's feelings if they weren't included in whatever activity she was planning. She has always been able to relate to people on a deeper level than people can, including myself, and I consider her a very good judge of character. I've often thought that I named her appropriately, Angela. She is a little angel. Also, at around three years of old, she began having terrifying night dreams and would wake up screaming. I've not been able to get much out of her about those dreams. She will rarely discuss them with me. To this day, she sleeps with the light on every night. She absolutely hates the full moon, can't sleep on such nights. When I made drapes for her room, I doubly lined them, and I'm afraid it did not help. Thank you very much for a chance to tell you about my daughter. Okay, next slide. Next slide. This is Angel. Next. Now these are examples of some of the paintings she did when she was 12 years old. 12 years old. This is not the exception, folks. This is the rule. Next. I mean, I, I can't even draw a straight line. About the only thing I can draw is flies. Next. everyone uh, real quickly uh, this is uh, Mike Rogers he was the crew boss uh, at the time the oldest one of the, of the group uh, Ken Peterson uh, next oldest he was uh, the one that was played by Peter Berg in the movie um, sort of a, a straight-laced real religious sort of fellow uh, Dwayne Smith, didn't know him too well. There's some confusion with the name Dwayne, because I had a brother named Dwayne. Well, this was a, a guy I'd met three days before the incident, so he was just on the crew working, as uh, is the situation with most of us uh, uh, there, that we're, we were just met each other in connection with the uh, job. We weren't a bunch of uh, friends, actually. Uh, this is uh, John Collette. And Alan Dallas, who's sort of the black sheep of the group, sort of been in and out of trouble all his life. And um, this is uh, Steve Pierce. Uh, he was played by Henry Thomas in the movie, uh, who I don't know if you recognize him when you saw the movie. He was uh, actually the little boy in the movie E.T. and uh, grown up and playing the part of this guy, who was also the youngest uh, of, of the crew members. And this was me back at the time, at the time. We were all riding in this uh, crew cab truck. Uh, we just finished a, a day's work in the woods, you know. A lot of people have uh, raised the uh, suspicion that uh, we were all uh, getting drunk and, <laughs> you know, just imagine the whole thing. But uh, this uh, work with chainsaws is very dangerous and, you know, you gotta have your wits about you uh, just to make it through the day without getting cut because even in spite of that, everybody gets cut. So, so um, we finished the work, and uh, this is not a situation where we've been on the road for hours. You know, like you know, we're quite a, a distance from town, and you know, get drowsy. You know, on a long drive, but you know, we hadn't gone very far, and we'd just recently been working, so our minds were very keen from the from the uh, you know vigorous uh, activity of the work. So. Uh, it was starting to get dark, and we were uh, driving out of the uh, area. And uh, uh, I noticed a, a little glimmer of light through the trees. And this wasn't anything that caught everyone's attention to, as a group uh, immediately. Um, it was just uh, everybody was, you know, 
four in the back and three in the front, and everybody was kind of divided up into their little conversations and we were going along. And I saw this light and didn't think a whole lot of it at first, and then the longer I looked, the more it was out of ordinary. And uh, this this light was uh, uh, just something that was out of place. You know, it was deer hunting season at the time, so I thought maybe some hunters were camped on the crest of the ridge. We were uh, driving uh, north towards the uh, main ridge in the area, the Mogollon Rim. And we're going up the back of this ridge, and it's a very rough dirt track, so we got to go really slow. And uh, the road um, sort of uh, was to the left side of the ridge back. So we're looking to the right of the road as we see this light. And uh, you know, I, I, I realized that uh, the light was coming from a point higher than ground level. So you know, although it was deer hunting season, I was thinking that maybe there was someone camped there. That, that explanation didn't pan out. And, and one by one, these little conversations in the group were, you know, ending, and people were, must have been looking where I was looking. Although they didn't say anything at first, and then, then we started commenting, what's, what's that, what's that, what's that, you know? And like, like in the movie, we thought uh, maybe it was a forest fire or something. Now in the movie, they had a reddish glow to it, but it was actually, uh, see, we compared the, the, the color like that of um, iron uh, coming out of a blast furnace, but, you know, we were talking white hot. You know, just just incredibly bright the way steel looks when it's uh, just about as hot as it can get. So they had this molten look to the craft that in the movie that wasn't uh, accurate. But uh, uh, once we you know realized that this light was coming up uh, you know from a from a point higher, I thought oh maybe a crashed plane you know hanging up in the tree. And we were asking what is this? But you know it's so dense that we couldn't really see the source of it. But up ahead on the road, you could see light washing across the, the, the path that we were on. And uh, so uh, I uh, was thinking, you know, we'll get a, get a look at it up there because there was an opening in the trees. And uh, when we got around the trees uh, to where we could see it, um, it was just right there. Um, this is, uh, this is the map of uh, the state of Arizona, and uh, the ridge that I'm talking about, the Mogollon Ridge, it's a, it's a great big cliff going east-west through Arizona, very high area. And a lot of people will think of Arizona as being something that's uh, all cactus and, and uh, like that, but um, this is uh, the largest uh, ponderosa pine forest in the world. So there's quite a lot of trees in northern Arizona, and uh, then an inset map on, on top of that would be this. A little more detail shows the position of the, the town in the upper right is Heber. That's the uh, county seat and where all the uh, law enforcement people were coming from. Shows the town where we were from, uh, coming out from Snowflake. And then we drove all the way out and way back up into the into the uh, forest uh, right on the incident. Anyway, back on track. There we are. Uh, th this object was just hovering there. Uh, a lot of people tried to explain this away as being uh, the planet Jupiter. Or, you know, <laughs> they go they go and look up the astronomical charts and they say, well, what was in the sky that night? And, you know, what could they have mistaken this for? But, you know, this was less than 100 feet away. There was no mistaking anything. You know, Alan Dallas, one of the guys in the back, uh, yelled, "It's a spaceship!" Right off the bat, and, uh, this thing was hovering in the sky, um, and uh, I yelled. For Mike to stop the truck, at least I think it was me. They say it was me. I don't remember saying it, but uh, uh, I threw open the door of the truck and I started towards this, uh, thinking that it would uh, leave before I got there. Now, very often uh, on the way to work, we'll see uh, wild animals or something, and we'll point point it out to the to the other men, uh, say, "Hey, look over there." And, by the time they look, if they're quick, they might catch a glimpse on it and it's gone. So and that was kind of the situation with the bear. You know, it was already running away and it was, you know, I was getting out and uh, it was really uh, not me chasing it, it was already running. So it's the same thing with this. I thought, 
well, I'm going to get out and run towards this, really impress the rest of the guys. And uh, so I get out and run towards them. This is really alarming the guys, and they're saying, hey, check it out. What are you doing? And uh, uh, as I got closer to it, I realized it wasn't going anywhere. And so I just kind of got myself in the jam there. Then I let it silly turn around and around. But, uh, so I continued forward at a slower pace. And, the closer I got, the more anxious they and I became. And uh, uh, as I got closer to it, uh, I could see that it, it was it was giving off a kind of a strange glow that just sort of uh, turned the uh, just kind of gave everything a strange look because it was a um, an odd color to to all the uh, uh, brushing area, and uh, it was making a, a very strange uh, sound, a, a mechanical sound that was uh, a real high-pitched, high-frequency, sort of a metal-on-metal metal sort of a sound, um, a real high-frequency sound, and, and then there was also a, a low rumble that just, you know, you could feel it more than hear it. And uh, uh, it was, you know, kind of like off the range of human hearing in, in both directions. but. As I got closer to it, um, I, I, I came up to, uh, there was a big pile of logging debris there, and uh, um, I couldn't get any, any closer to directly under it than, say, up at an angle about like this, and yeah, because of this brush pile. So as I came up to that, suddenly um, the sound got louder and it started to move. It made a motion, uh, sort of like a rocking motion. The same side was towards us, but um, it rose up at the same time. And, and the power in the increase in sound was, uh, scared me. And I jumped for cover. There was a log sticking up there, and I hid down behind that. And the, and the guys in the truck, the rest of the crew, were getting really frantic and, and screaming and swearing at me to get away from there. But, you know, I didn't need to be told. I was, you know, planning on how I was going to get out of this situation. And uh, so I, I raised up and I turned to run back to the truck. And as I raised up, I felt this shock go through my body. It, was, it felt kind of like a, an electric shock or like, like kind of like a physical blow that just, if you've ever been, you know, tackled when you didn't see it coming playing football, something like that. It's, a, it's just wham, and I blacked out. But uh, the uh, crew said that uh, a blast of energy came out of the bottom of this craft and hit me. They said it just looked like a grenade, like it just uh, a blast of energy so powerful it just was, was blinding. It just lit up the whole area and they said it just threw me through the air. And uh, they just freaked out because, you know, they thought it killed me. They said that when I hit the ground my body just fell limp and, and they figured they were next. So, you know, the... There was a lot of criticism, you know, the media would interview these guys and they'd make remarks about how could you take off on leaving like that, and, and even my own family was, were, were pretty hostile to the crew because because they weren't being more heroic, but in the situation that they were in, you know, I, I don't know that I'd have done any different because, you know, they had no weapons, they, there was no nothing that they could do, and if they thought I was already killed, then maybe the smartest thing was for them to just clear out. But uh, they said they took off, they panicked, they, were, they uh, drove that truck in ways that had never been driven before and, and that uh, they, uh, uh, they didn't get wrecked, the truck just almost destroyed it, they trying to get away. And uh, uh, they, they were just so... Uh, panic that you know it took them a while to kind of get their wits about them. But then when they when they could see that the you know they put enough distance between them to where they they couldn't uh, see the, the the thing pursuing them, they stopped and, and they said they had this big arguing and screaming match. It was really crazy. They, they yelled back and forth and were trying to decide what to do. And they were, for some reason were going to try to build a fire. I guess it was just the psychological security of it. But they were getting started to do that and then. 
they looked up towards the river and they could see a uh, pickup, a camper, or some uh, uh, maybe deer hunters uh, passing through up there. And so they, they said, hey, yeah, let's, get, let's go get them. Maybe they've got some guns that can help us, you know. So they threw everything in the truck and took off again and, and tried to catch the uh, hunters, but uh, they weren't able to catch up with them. And so uh, um, in the movie they have uh, Mike saying, you know, like, we got to go back, and the guy saying, no, and this all happened. But, but when it came down to it, Mike says, you know, this truck's going back whether you guys, you guys can stay here or not. Those guys weren't about to stay there in the dark like they did in the movie. <laughs> so they all said, all right, we'll go, you know, and they got in the car with them and, and returned. And as they approached the area, they uh, saw a light rise up and streak off. And so that kind of gave them a little more courage to go on in. And uh, they found the spot where, where it had been, and uh, it was gone. Uh, they said they made a surge. They, they, well, they, they said it took them a lot of time to build up the courage to even get out of the truck. But, you know, they're... They got out and they had one flashlight between them and said that they're, they're all just huddled around it like you know, these big tough woods guys are all just huddled around this one flashlight going around trying to see what they can find and, and calling and, and uh, weren't able to find anything. They said they saw tracks go from where the truck was parked up to the single clearing and that was it. So when they were unable to uh, uh, you know, find me there, they uh, decided that they better go get some help. Went back to town. Uh, there was a lot of argument about what to do. They were saying, nobody's going to believe this. Let's just get some friends. We'll go back and, and some guns and, you know, and uh, make our own search. And, and uh, Ken Peterson, the religious guy, he says, no, we've got to be straight with us about you know, the start. You know, we'll just report it and uh, let the chips fall where they may. So well, Alan was against going to the authorities, but they finally decided they would. And unlike in the movie, uh, where they had Mike making the call, it was uh, it was Kim Peterson that called the uh, authorities. The deputy came down, and, and they started explaining things. And uh, I mean, you know, uh, was interviewed later, and, and the sheriff was called from the county seat. He came down, and the sheriff and his next in command, the under sheriff, um, uh, they they said that they uh, were. <coughs> looking for signs of intoxication. You know, the sheriff says, uh, you know, I was looking and I didn't see any such thing. But one thing that really struck them is that uh, they knew something uh, had really happened here. These guys were totally shook. And, you know, one of the guys was still crying. But because of their incredible emotional state, they still weren't going to believe this. They thought, well, they killed this guy. And they're making up this story to cover up for, for what they've done. Uh, but, uh, they knew they had a serious case here, and the sheriff classified it as a missing persons, and they organized a, a massive search. That night, they returned the, and with the, they couldn't get some of the guys to go back. They just would not go back, and uh, never have gone back. They just refused to go back there, and, and wouldn't ever. One of the guys, uh, you know, for years afterwards, I uh, heard that he didn't go outside at night, but. It was pretty traumatic for everyone, but uh, in spite of the fact that, you know, later Alan, uh, Dwayne Smith was saying that Alan Dallas was, uh, you know, the most scared and that he was, what like Dwayne said, kissed his knees because he was hiding down behind the level of the door and, you know, uh, was afraid to even peek over the, 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 the window much uh, and what was going on. Uh, Alan was one of the ones who returned and, and Dwayne wasn't. Uh, Smith wasn't so. So I gotta uh, give credit where credit's due. Those guys did have the courage to go back. Of course, they were with the bombmen and, and who were armed. Uh, uh, they made a search, and uh, one of the, the the under sheriff was an expert tracker, and he was unable to find any uh, sign of anything except you know the tracks going in the middle of the clearing. And this was the same situation uh, the next day when they brought out the uh, massive search and rescue team. Uh, the Silver Creek Rescue Team, uh, the uh, Forest Service, uh, a lot of civilian volunteers, uh, and of course the, uh, the Sheriff's Department. Uh, they uh, had over 50 men, some on horseback, uh, combed the area, made 
you know, wide searches where you know people were spaced equally across there. They had uh, some rather strange situations. The, the tracking dogs, of course, were unable to find anything except the trail from the truck to the middle of the clearing, and that was the end of it. Uh, the uh, the horses uh, were acting very strangely, and uh, they they were behaving oddly. And, and so one of the horses just bolted, and uh, they had uh, aircraft crisscrossing the area. They uh, just combed the area. I mean, this was a the search that went on for four days. Uh, during this time, uh, there was a man that Mike noticed uh, had a, a Geiger counter. You know, he was you know, checking the the, the uh, scene there at the uh, at the clearing. And uh, Mike uh, came up to him and he said, "What you doing?" And the guy acted real hostile. It was kind of strange because this Forest Service guy, you know, Mike is, had been the, the crew boss and he'd been doing this. He's uh, government contracts for years and he'd never seen anybody uh, this guy in, in the area at all before. But uh, and uh, you'll also notice that in the credits to the movie, there's a, a, a credit for Geiger counter man. And, uh, this was a scene that was uh, filmed and never used for some reason. Anyway, uh, he uh, they said, "You find anything?" He goes, "No, no, this is just background radiation." He says, "Well, uh, how about how about testing us?" You know. And so he uh, tested the men and didn't find anything. He says, "This this reading right here is just the same as background, one and a half." And he says, "A real reading is like this." And he put it up to his uh, radium dial watch. And the thing went up to three. So they said, hey, hey how about our hard hats? You know, we washed and showered and changed our clothes. And since then, so, but our hard hats, test them. So we brought them over there. Reading goes up to six. And the guy looks at him real funny, puts his equipment away and walks away. It's a very strange uh, reaction uh, that was rather curious. We never did get to the bottom of that. But there was a lot of things of that nature along the way. Um, during the search, the, uh, some of the searchers uh, were making accusations, some of the lawmen, towards the men about, uh, come on, where'd you hide the body? And uh, so the men were saying, hey, <laughs> we'll, we're telling the truth and we'll do anything it takes uh, to prove it. So they volunteered for sodium pentothal, lie detector tests, anything that they wanted. And so uh, the uh, law enforcement men uh, set it up. Uh, this is Sheriff Gillespie. Uh, and uh, they brought in the state police polygraph examiner, Cy Gelson. Uh, he's the top expert in the, in the state, and probably one of the top in the nation at the time, one of the top in the world presently. And he tested the men, and they passed. So now, what are they going to do? You know, what happened to the murder theory? Uh, uh, they. People were desperate to explain this way any way they could, and so uh, alternate theories were then offered. But um, from from the moment that I was, you know, hit by the beam, I, I don't recall anything uh, until I uh, woke up, uh, apparently on board the craft. Um, I was in a lot of pain. I didn't know where I was at first. I was lying on my back. There was a light above me. Uh, I was I was in and out of consciousness for quite a, a long period of time, and my thinking was very, you know, disorganized. And not really fully conscious. Uh, and the pain was just overwhelming. It just kind of like knocked me back out again, sort of. A, and the light above me well, wasn't all that bright, but it was painful to look at for some reason. It, at, uh, in the condition I was in. But I could hear the sounds of movement around me and I finally remembered the uh, incident in the woods and, and uh, I, th I figured out, uh, well, maybe I was hurt and I was taken to a hospital. And yeah, yeah, that's where I'm at. Uh, I was in the, in the hospital. So I'm hearing the sounds of movement around me and I'm thinking it's, it's the doctors and uh, I could feel this instrument or this thing laying on my chest and I I could uh, see that it was you know, about you know, three or four inches thick and curved across my chest. And uh, so, you know, I, I figured I better lay still and cooperate with the doctors, not cause any problems, because, you know, I was in a lot of pain and I was very concerned about what had happened to me. 
uh, I could, uh, uh, my eyes weren't focusing very good, but I, I could see the vague, blurry forms of the doctors around me. And, but when I finally got where I could clear my eyes and clear my vision and, and, and see, is, is when I saw these creatures standing over me, and I just, I just flipped out, and I just became hysterical. <laughs> um, my mind was just racing at the same time. My, my, my body just wouldn't work. You know, uh, I tried to just, you know, spring away from them, but I was, I was so weakened that when I lashed out at them, I just, the one that was, that was there to the side of me just, it was more of a push than a hit. I didn't, he just kind of fell back into the other one. And when I got up, this uh, thing that was lying across my chest fell off. And they come around the table towards me, and I was just sort of staggered back away from them against the back wall. There was a there was a bench there uh, I leaned against, and uh, as they came towards me, I, I grabbed for something to uh, you know fin them off with, and uh, I picked up a long thin uh, object, a clear glass or plastic uh, tube or rod or something, and. Uh, uh, tried to break the end of it off and it wouldn't break, so I just, I just uh, held it in a threatening way and sh struck at them. They weren't close enough for me to hit, but I was just making threatening motions to keep them away. I was screaming at them, "Stay away, stay away!" And uh, they stopped, and uh, they just sort of all at once turned and left the room. And uh, you know, I was you know pumping out all this adrenaline trying to get my body to move, and I was not having a lot of uh, response. Uh, everything seemed sluggish and I was very weak and I was uh, having a lot of trouble breathing. And uh, I, I just couldn't catch my breath. But uh, when, they, when they left the room, they had gone out the hallway at the back and uh, turned right. And that was the only uh, doorway out of there. I was afraid they would return. And so I went out of the same door, but uh, I turned left. And you know, this wasn't big, it was very cramped. You know, the ceiling was just way down low and, and the passage was very narrow and it was dimly lit. And you know, the, my panic was really, really aggravated by the fact that I couldn't catch my breath. And I was just, felt like I was suffocating all the time. And uh, I, I took off in, in a run to, because, you know, afraid of what was behind me, but the passageway curved so tightly to the right that, you know, I was torn between not being able to see if anything was coming up behind me and not being able to see if I was running into something worse. But uh, I finally got a grip on myself and I, I uh, looked into a, a room that uh, had, uh, was empty of any um, creatures or beings or anything, and, and um, I saw the outline of uh, what I took to be doorways on the opposite side that I thought might be an escape. You know, and after piecing together the, the, the layout of what I'd traveled through, you know, in this diagram here, I can see that it was a foolish thought to think that those were a way out, but you know, that's what I was thinking at the time. Which, I wasn't thinking very clearly. It was just kind of a panicked, uh, desperate, you know, try anything sort of approach. And, uh, but when I moved into this room, there was a chair in there, and uh, this chair uh, was had its back to me, and I, and I thought there might be somebody sitting in it. So I moved around to the to the side along the wall before I, you know, moved into the room more. Uh, when I could see that there was no one sitting in the chair, but uh, uh, as I moved into the center of the room, it darkened, and uh, I, I stepped back and it, and it lightened again. I could see the walls, but when I got close to the center, it got very dark, and I could see points of light, like uh, a planetarium or uh, some sort of viewing uh, method of uh, star pattern. Uh, there was some controls on the arm of this chair, and I was uh, attempting to uh, open doors or, you know, see if I could... Uh, I, I, at one point I went over to these doorways, these outlines on the wall, and um, there was uh, 
no light visible through the crack and no air coming through. But I didn't find any buttons or any, any way to open the door. So I was thinking the buttons on this chair might open the door. And which they didn't. Most of the buttons didn't seem to uh, do anything. Some of them would make those lines on the, on the screen change. Uh, they weren't like uh, characters, numbers or letters. They were just uh, long straight lines with little segments on them at different angles. And uh, sometimes they would move and change angles, but a lot of times they just didn't do anything. When I uh, moved the lever, uh, the star pattern moved. Not, not the points of light in relation to each other, but the entire pattern moved. And that was very disorienting because it was you know, kind of like my whole frame of reference, you know, was shifting. It was sort of a dizzying sort of feeling. I, I thought I might be really making things worse <laughs> uh, doing that. But at this point, I, I sensed, or I, I don't know if I heard something or if there was a change in light, but uh, the doorway that I came through, uh, what I took to be a man appeared, and uh, I thought he was like from the Air Force or somebody, you know, that was there to rescue me. And so I, I went up to him and I started, you know, battling all these uh, questions at him. And uh, he didn't answer me. And uh, I thought, well, you know, maybe it's because he was wearing this helmet and uh, he either couldn't hear me or couldn't speak with it all. So when he wanted me to go with him, I went. Uh, he took me out of uh, this craft uh, into uh, this large enclosure. It was a, shaped, a, a large room shaped like a, a quarter of a cylinder turned on its side. And uh, when, as soon as I got out of there, you know, it seemed like the air was a lot fresher and easier to breathe. Although the, the, the pain was still uh, pretty much there. Uh, I, it, they also, the light was much brighter. It sort of uh, hurt my eyes a little bit at first, but it was, much, it was kind of like uh, sunlight coming through these, uh, through and from these panels. I don't know if they were artificial lights or, or just translucent panels on the, on the wall that you see in this picture. It just curved over into the ceiling. You know, it was a quarter of the cylinder. I tried to look around. There were some other disc-shaped objects, um, uh, machines uh, in this, in, but he was seemed to be in a really big hurry and moved me out of this room, uh, down the hallway. To another room, and uh, he, there were some other people in there, and he left me with them. And uh, I thought, well, because they're not wearing helmets, you know, I'm going to try these questions again. Uh, and so I started in with all the same questions again: Where am I? You know, what's going on here? You know, uh, I want out of here. I want to. I want. I want to go home. But. Uh, uh, they didn't answer either. They started leading me over to this table, and then I was having a lot of serious misgivings about whether I, was I rescued or was this uh, out of the frying pan into the fire. And so I started to resist them. I was still very weak, and there was three of them, and they were much stronger than I am. And they managed to get me on the table. Uh, they pushed me down, and uh, one of them, a, a woman, uh, had a, a mask my hand that you put over my face. I managed with a great deal of effort to get one hand free and uh, get it under the edge of the mask and I started to pull it away when I lost consciousness. Um, I blacked out instantly and uh, I, I didn't remember anything more until I woke up um, lying face down mm. beside a, a highway. It was cold. I came to very quickly. There was a light from above and I, it caught my attention and as I turned to look to see where the light was coming from, it went off. So I don't know whether it was a light on the bottom of this uh, craft or uh, a hatch closing. 
but I just saw in the dark the uh, shiny chrome, polished like curving hull there for just a few instants, uh, seconds, and then it just shot straight up into the sky. And uh, it moved so quickly. It, it stirred the air, it moved the tree and the leaves and, and the grass beside the road, but I, I didn't, you know, you'd think it would just make a shrieking sound, like, uh, like a bullet moving through the air or something that moved so quickly it was out of sight. But maybe that was just partly because it wasn't lit. Uh, anyway, I recognized this stretch of road. I saw the lights of the town down below, and uh, I don't know where I got the strength because I was when I got to my feet I was so wobbly. Uh, but with the last of my strength, I ran down into the town, and uh, I went across the first bridge. And there was a building with lights on there and smoke coming out of the chimney. And I went and beat on the door, and nobody came. So I ran down on across the second bridge, and I came to a service station there, and there was a, a row of a telephone booths there. I went into the first one, and uh, it was out of order. So <laughs> I was at the end of my rope there, but uh, I went into the next phone booth and managed to call my family. I, uh, and at that time, in that part of the country, you didn't even have to have a, a coin to talk to the operator. Um, come to find out later, the uh, operator listened in on the phone call and uh, tipped off the uh, law enforcement uh, that the call had been made, which, you know, although that's illegal, it was actually a fortunate thing at the time to verify, you know, that what was being said was true. But uh, my family came and got me and the, the, the sheriff's deputies that were sent out to their I uh, must have missed us by seconds, but uh, they did know that the call came from there, contrary to many theories the skeptics had to offer. Uh, at that time, I did not realize how much time had gone by. You know, this four-day search, there was five days and six hours missing, and uh, I only recalled such a short period of time, I thought it was the same night. And somehow in the conversation, I was, I was trying to get out what had happened to me and I just kept breaking down. I just couldn't, couldn't, you know, say it without, you know, I just, I was in pretty bad shape, but my brother, uh, when he picked up on this time thing, he said, feel your face. And I, I felt and I had, you know, a week's growth. And uh, I looked at my watch, the date had changed. And I knew how much time ago. It was quite a shock and I just, I, I just sort of went catatonic at that point. but. They got me back to town and I found out all the stuff that had been going on in, in my absence, that there had been uh, uh, news media from all over the world coming through town. It was just a mob scene. It was just crazy. And, and uh, the family had received uh, a lot of uh, phone calls. Uh, there was a nurse saying that she had uh, been working in a hospital um, and something like this had happened. This couple came in and had this incident happen. and. Uh, uh, when she came back on shift, the couple was gone, their records were gone, and everybody in the, on the staff was saying, what are you talking about, you know? So she was warning the family, you know, to, to be careful about just, uh, you know, who got a hold of me, uh, should I ever be retired. And there was another man that said he was retired CIA and left the same kind of warnings, you know? And, you know, even though the guy left his name and contact information, uh, since been lost, but. You know, the family took it to be a uh, crank calls, and even even when I called my family that night, you know, they thought it was another prank call and started to hang up. So uh, there was a lot of suspicion and mistrust. My uh, brother took me to uh, Phoenix at that time to, uh, because of concerns of, of my medical condition, but he wasn't going to trust the local situation. So. Finally, to make a long story short, in the movie there's a really flaky uh, UFO investigative organization that uh, we were better off not ever having gotten uh, had any contact with. But uh, finally wound up with uh, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization here who sponsored uh, a lot of tests, um, medical tests, 
there was a theory being offered, okay, all right, these guys believe that this happened, but they were all drunk or on drugs out there, and they just hallucinated this thing. So um, I had uh, blood and urine samples run through the county medical examiner's drug screen, which showed no trace of any drugs in my body. How about we start with how, how you first got involved with Billy? Okay, uh, a little more than 26 years ago, I was in a bookstore in California, in Los Angeles area, and I saw the first tabletop, uh, you know, coffee table size photo book of the Meyer uh, photos and some of the texts. It was stunning and just had a resonance of authenticity about it, so I bought it and read it, looked at it uh, for some time, and uh, there wasn't much more I could do except ooh and awe. And some years later, I just happened to meet someone in a little cafe in Sedona, Arizona, that had the transcripts of Meyer's conversations with these alleged extraterrestrials over a period of about three years or so, from 75 to 78 plus. And there were almost 2,000 pages. He gave them to me upon my return to Los Angeles, and I started to study all the information in there. And that basically triggered this whole process of investigating, researching, and ultimately being able to re represent the case. Mm -hmm. And um, have you had the privilege of meeting Billy personally? Yes, uh, for the past five years I've gone over to Switzerland and spent some time with him and with other people involved in the case. Yeah. Have you, uh, uh, while you were with Billy, did you at any time experience anything uh, of that around him? Uh, like um, the UFOs that he photographed? No, uh, I didn't experience them. Uh, just about every time I've been there, someone who had been at, uh, at the visit either a little earlier or a little later over the period of time had, uh, there were si plenty of sightings yeah. during this period of time by people. I would generally go home and go to sleep at the bed and breakfast and then find out in the morning that two or three people were watching the craft come about, you know. Yeah. That type of thing. It's actually for them over there. It's pretty much old news. It's still the contacts are still, uh, according to Meyer and all the people, still going on. But that the, the craft part of it is, uh, you know, they've been used to it for thirty years. Yeah, um, he has come out with a lot of predictions over the years about you know certain issues of um, planet, planetary changes, um, wars, um, catastrophes, and. He, he wrote them down, and a lot of them, those predictions have actually come to truth, haven't they? So far, everything that uh, they gave him as specific information, uh, meaning th where they would tell him a, a given event was going to occur somewhere specifically, it mm -hmm. had. Yeah. And the details corresponded to what Meyer was told. And in all the searching I did on the Internet, which he didn't have access to at this time, of course, it appears that with the exception of maybe one item, maybe two, uh, he was the first source of publication yeah. of that information. When you say they, um, could you explain it, uh, um, a little about who they are, who he's actually in touch with? The Plejaren, P-L-E-J-A-R-E-N, are said to be extraterrestrial humans who are ancestrally connected to us and uh, their forefathers, you know, they claim were the gods of our antiquity in many, many cases. There were other extraterrestrials said to also have played these types of roles in our past. And so through their distant ancestors, they were connected vis-a-vis uh, -vis these gods, as well as through some of the either genetic uh, manipulations and or matings that may have taken place also through some of these people with indigenous, slowly evolving uh, earth people. Right. So um, there's been plenty of interaction prior to um, actually getting in touch with Billy, uh, with other people, um, these pal Palladians? Mm -hmm. The Playaren? Playarns. Well, it depends. If you want to go back into the full history of the whole thing, yes. Mm -hmm. um, they claim that this mission, if you will, has been going on for a very long time. Uh, if you go into simply what's said in the case, you're going back in terms of this being a, uh, let's say, corrective mission, uh, an attempt mm -hmm. to get humanity uh, back on path without directly interfering with us, you're talking at least 13,500 years ago. And basically, though they have had certain contacts with other people, their primary contacts have been uh, then almost exclusively with one particular spirit Mm -hmm. incarnating over many, many millennia as different people. The distinction being 
it's the spirit that reincarnates and the personality in person yeah. is different each time. Yeah. So they uh, have put forth that they have contacted a specific, a specific lineage of prophets. Right. And just so people don't get put off by that term and think that there's some great exalted claims being made here, a prophet is basically a thankless job mm -hmm. that somebody takes on. And there have been different lineages of prophets, it should certainly be said. But the prophet plays the role of an announcer of truth, a herald, of, not for the purpose of starting a religion or gaining a following, but for the purpose of helping humanity to become aware of errors in beliefs, in conduct, in, in outcomes that are as yet unforeseen mm -hmm. by humanity, being somewhat blind as we may be to how the universe really works, that is through the laws of cause and effect primarily. So the prophets have come or been sent, however you want to look at it, as a um, remedial measure, as a, as a very generous, uh, almost self-sacrificial, without meaning that they're here to sacrifice, but mm -hmm. a sacrifice of a lot of personal comfort and uh, they take on an awful lot of discomfort, pain, very often uh, being attacked, brutalized, murdered, what have you, in an attempt to put on the table for humanity those things which we, if we have the wit and wisdom to do it, would look at, uh, digest, learn from, and use to help make course corrections so that we have a more graceful and peaceful future. Mm -hmm. And how difficult has Billy actually found um, getting that message across? Is, it, is There's been um, a lot of difficulty within the UFO fields themselves, I would say. Well, yeah, we could say that um, the primary difficulty has been dodging 21 documented assassination attempts. Wow. That means that there are people out there that are going to an awful lot of trouble to try and eliminate a hoaxer, right? Yeah, if right. people say it's yeah. a hoaxer. Uh, huge, uh, in terms of, let's say, the non-terminal uh, <laughs> type of attack, have come from, the, these attacks have come from the UFO community. Mm -hmm. People who simply say it's, well, his evidence is too good to be true. Now, there's a mm -hmm. trap. You either have evidence that's too bad to be true or it's too good to be true. And to this day, many of the know-it-alls in the so-called UFO community rail against Meyer, attack him. They might as well be the skeptics. And the skeptics, of course, are another grouping of people. And uh, I did issue a challenge to the top international professional skeptics to duplicate only one of Meyer's photos and one of his films. I did that in 2001. International organization is known for cent as Center for Inquiry, mm -hmm. Center for Inquiry West in Los Angeles. They said that Meyer's evidence was an easily duplicated hoax, and I said, "Great, will you duplicate one photo? Will you duplicate this film segment?" And they said, "Sure." Four, almost five years later, they've been unable to do it. All they could produce in four years were six little photos of a model UFO that they then emphatically refused to have tested to the same standards of testing that had authenticated Myers as being a real photo's real graph. Yeah. And but when I think of Billy Meyer, I think of the grown man who's the messenger. What about Billy Meyer as a person has a growing per, you know from a young boy to the grown man who's being delivered all these messages. I mean, how is how does he um, how has he evolved from little kid on out? Yeah, on well, up. That's another element of the story. It's so amazing. Uh, it's it's, it's beyond comprehension in a sense because his contact started when he was only five years of age and they were not abductions, they were voluntary and they remain voluntary, face to face, on board, on planet, <laughs> wherever, contacts with these humans from another star system. Over the years, well to give you an example, his first teacher was a man named Svath, S-F-A-T-H, Svath, and he helped work with Billy from the age of five, I think it, perhaps up to about, oh, I'm forgetting the exact thing, it was something like 11 or years, maybe 14 years, maybe something. Uh, I haven't written down, but I don't yeah, know what Yeah, that's means. all right. So he told him, not only did he tell him amazing things, he gave him future histories, mm -hmm. uh, coming events, prophecies, predictions. He worked with him with devices that were placed on young Edward's head. His name, his given name was Edward Albert mm -hmm. Meyer. And by the time Meyer was seven years of age, 
He had the thinking capacity of a 35-year-old man, which brought him enormous difficulties because he was really becoming an odd fellow. Yeah. Since he couldn't confide in anybody except one man, the parish priest, Father Zimmerman, he certainly couldn't tell his playmates, even his family for a long time, what mm -hmm. was happening to him. So he ended up in, in, in tr being truant, being put in uh, delinquent schools for periods of time, thrown out of classes. Mm -hmm. All this time he's having experiences that no human being has had to this day, mm -hmm. conscious, voluntary, mind-expanding experiences. Uh, when he's 14, Meyer published a letter of Spot's information with the help of Father Zimmerman and sent it around to 3,000 different people and, and you know parties around the, the world laying out prophetic information about the events, many of which are happening right now. Mm -hmm. And he was totally ignored. Totally ignored. 1951. 3,000 letters. That's 50, as of today, it's 54 years ago. He sent yeah. this out. And when you see what they had, uh, you know, um, indicated at that time specifically, enumerating all these different specific things that were coming our way, you go, gee, wh why wasn't there one person or one party of 3,000 that took this seriously enough to, to start to, you know, open, open their minds? Mm. Well, do you think it was because of his age at the time? It could have been, but then again, you know, these letters were sent out. Maybe they didn't know how old he was, but mm. maybe people just wrote it off as fanciful stuff. And in the ensuing, shortly thereafter, Meyer joined the French Foreign Legion. He was like <laughs> only 15 years of age or something. He didn't like it. So in six months' time or so, he walked out across the desert. Very few people, you know, a little emphasis there for drama, mm -hmm. but very few people <laughs> ever... Uh, survive uh, leaving the French Foreign Legion, let alone walking across the desert to get out. Yeah. On top of that, uh, he met many of the world's major players, people who would become world leaders. He met, when he was 10, Spath took him to meet Gandhi mm -hmm. one time. Yeah, actually, uh, I've he, read that Gandhi saw a UFO. It's probably it right has, there. Yeah. See, I didn't know that part. Yeah. Because I wondered, well, I wonder... Did, you know, had Gandhi ever said anything to anyone else? So mm -hmm. apparently he did. Yeah. Uh, Meyer met everyone from Gandhi to Saddam Hussein. Wow. Tito, the Shah of Iran, the King Farouk. I mean, the most amazing variety of people. And of course, they were at various stages of ascendancy of power mm -hmm. back in the late 50s and 60s. Uh, he but studied how, how hmm? did that come about to actually Get be the, from a, a man in the country in Switzerland to becoming to meet world leaders? Yeah. I mean, how was that transition? that transition? Well, let's remember he was prepared for this task by people who were, if they exist, they're pretty hmm. advanced. And being pretty advanced doesn't mean just that they have craft that fly around. It means that they are advanced in their sciences, in their psychology, in their ability to transfer information, to teach. And he is said to be uh, the current incarnation of a very old spirit, so mm -hmm. the capacity to work with that person, yeah. that young yeah. person, to bring him up rather quickly through the ranks of experience and knowledge. When you see the photographs, as we should be showing them tonight, of Meyer when he's 20 and 25 and, and all in, in all these different countries, you see a very worldly individual who's not just the little smiling, you know, five or eight year old boy that we, we first see. He's a man that traveled through 43 different countries on foot, 155,000 miles, picked up and did about 300 and some odd jobs in his time of learning and traveling. So he had been given certain impetus and direction, let's say. Mm -hmm. He had inside himself a consciousness that was very advanced, so he appears to be a very just simple, regular fellow and does to this day. So uh, perhaps with a little help from the play iron and his own wits, he wound his way around places and to meeting people. He made himself of service to different people as a, a translator or a private detective, a snake catcher, you name it. Mm -hmm. He did all these different things. So he would get his, weave his way around. We have a photograph of him standing with two palace guards in Jordan at King Hussein's you know, palace. You, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Zelig with Woody Allen. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like Billy Meyer is Zelig meets Indiana Jones, meets Star Wars. Wow. And you put it all together and you got a guy, because today people think, oh, he's that little bearded farmer with those funny UFO photos. Yeah, well, this, that's what people in Australia probably think that's what he they is. They have no idea yeah. the depth and breadth of this case and this man's experience. What he knows, what he can talk about. Uh, to this day, uh, well, let me put it this way. 
right above his property in Switzerland, where he lives with his family and people and they work, there's a military base, coincidentally, right up the hill, right? Mm -hmm. A year ago, when I was sitting and talking to him for a while, he says, you know, I have to shorten the meeting because I have some people coming from the base that have some questions for me about some health issues and things. I said, fine. He consults mm -hmm. with all sorts of people on all sorts of stuff, not as a guru or as a master, but simply as someone who has information about many different things. And uh, indeed he does. He uh, he very often has been the one who will oversee the planting of the different trees and plants in the property. Since they took over that particular center, uh, which was a rundown farmhouse with no floors, electricity, or running water, mm. and they renovated and built it up, they've planted 10,000 trees in the property in large measure to protect against the assassination attempts because there's so many people that wanted to, to shoot them. They put up a living blockade of trees, which made the place very beautiful. Yeah. About his life. And his yeah, life. his life. Yeah. So, um, well, he, as a person, is reincarnated as a spirit of, of, um, a, what would you say, an advanced being from well, another place? Or? Let's put it this way, and this is this is what I call speculative information. See, yeah. in the case you have things that are factual, meaning. Not only have I been able to prove them, mm -hmm. anybody can. You just take the information, do your research, and go, okay, there it is. Yeah. Um, then there's the speculative information, which means I am not in the position to or haven't been able to as yet either prove it or disprove it. And that can be information that goes back long periods of time, which we don't have access to means of determining the truthfulness or not, or future events that haven't occurred. As mm -hmm. far as Meyer is concerned, here's simply what's said in the case about it. And people have to understand that this is not done for any purpose of trying to start a belief system or anything else. Mm -hmm. Meyer's spirit had originated long, long ago, billions of years ago, and had already run through the incarnational cycle of millions and millions and millions of lifetimes mm -hmm. in another star system. and had mm -hmm. been a major leader for a long time in a, in a certain dynamic. It came back into the incarnational pattern, which is not usually ever done, for the particular mission of working, especially with the problems inherent to Earth humans, because of a connection via the play Aran people and their ancestors, and going back farther to whom Meyer's original spirit form was. So in this incarnational pattern, Meyer, the agreement, if you will, the mission would involve Meyer's, we're using him in this term yeah. here, that spirit incarnating seven times specific lineage of prophets. Enoch, Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Emmanuel, Muhammad, and Billy. Now, if people haven't heard of Emmanuel, it's because his name got changed to Jesus and they formed a religion around mm -hmm. it, okay? So that doesn't mean Billy's Muhammad or Billy's Jesus or Billy's Elijah. It simply means that spirit form is the same one that was in those beings. Uh, in all cases, we've had distortions about who they were and what their lives were like. And in every, ex every time, without exception, anywhere in this universe, a sp spirit form incarnating as a human being is simply a human being. They're not divine. They're not God, quote-unquote. They are simply a human with a, a task to do. Because his spirit was ancient enough and had already been highly developed, it could volunteer to go back into the beginning of incarnation, in fact, all over again. Mm -hmm. So he has to go through evolution again, just like everyone else. Right. And in all the, the coming uh, incarnations of that spirit form, he won't be a prophet again. It's yeah. done with, with Billy. He'll be another human on earth, just like everybody else. He may have more uh, higher developed spirit, more advanced abilities or something, but that won't be so relevant. This particular mission is for the purpose of bringing forth what they call the original and true teachings of the creation so that we can get on course. Now the creation is the term that they use for this very universe in which we live. They say this is the living entity of all consciousness and creation in this universe and there's billions of universes. We can't quite wrap our brains around all this so let's just say that when we normally speak of God mm -hmm. Oftentimes, what we're intending is to say the most powerful, the creator of everything. Except they also say that in every single case, there, wherever you have a god, especially a god in the sky, you're always talking about more advanced humans who came here long ago mm -hmm. as space travelers 
and then became addicted to the power of working with primitive, slowly developing, you know, earth humans, and represented themselves as the creation. They called themselves God or the Lord or what have you. And a huge part of this play Aaron mission is to get us out of this mindset so that instead of behaving because we are run by our beliefs, that we will trouble ourselves to start to think, to examine, to reason, to incorporate logic, and to enter the age of knowledge and leave behind the age of belief, or beliefs as well. Mm -hmm. And that that is a huge task. They see that this particular mission, this bringing this information once again, because it's not original teaching, this is ancient, ancient teaching, mm -hmm. once again, this is going to take 700 years to unfold. So, so how far down the track are we? We're just, we have 700 more years oh to go <laughs> before, they, before we will become what they consider to be true human beings. So what we have to do is, base, um, is discard the belief and go on the search of knowledge because that, that is what's going to make us grow universally. Not yeah. a belief system, but belief a, a knowledgeable system of learning and growing and in that sense because beliefs cause... Problems. Cause big problems. Now, in re, re, in reality, as we know it, anyhow, beliefs are not that easily dismissed. You t tell a world of seven and a half billion people, listen, get rid of your belief systems and let's get into reality and knowledge and truth. That's so crazy. You're you're nuts. Mm -hmm. And as we can see, also we have at least three major belief systems, maybe mm -hmm. four or five, ultimately, that are going to be warring with each other, as well as the secular uh, thoughts. Uh, generated uh, nations and policies and mm -hmm. peoples and some of whom will also be aligning with beliefs it's a mess yeah. because we're not operating on truth and knowledge empirical knowledge for instance i say to people do you believe in gravity and someone will say yes and i say well why what do you need to believe in it for it's a fact you don't have to believe in it you have to acknowledge it mm -hmm. because it's real mm -hmm. the problems with religion without meaning to offend anybody's beliefs but you know what on the other hand, I don't care if I offend beliefs because I don't care if anybody offends my beliefs. Someone would say to me, well, you believe this and so and this and so. And if they identify something I believe in, I'll say, well, okay, well, let's look at it. Well, you're right. That's just a belief. I, and I'm, we all have beliefs. Mm -hmm. And some times people confuse values with beliefs. They say, well, you believe in good. This, that. I say, well, those are values I hold of human conduct. So if you, if you go back to this idea of uh, religions, Let's say you've got six holy books or so, I don't know, the, uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the Book of Mormon, uh, Buddhist text, Tibetan Buddhist text, whatever, and you put all those in a nice big old long table, and you get a hundred people that don't have any religious beliefs, and you say, we want you to come in, read each of these books, and I want you to line up behind the truth. You know, you're going to have people behind each one of those six or more belief systems. Now, right away, you know that if that's the truth, then that can't be the truth, that can't be. So suddenly we, in terms of logic, we're going to say, well, logically speaking, we don't have exclusive truth here, even though each of you think that's the truth. Because there is truth in every belief system. Yeah. But just like any other form of disinformation, it's wound up in control-oriented lies, rituals, superstitions, and hocus-pocus that people get fed lock, stock, and barrel, and in our innocence, uh, our fear, any number of things, we adopt a belief system. Mm -hmm. And I happen to think that a lot of people go into religions for actually good reasons. They want to be good people. We want to do good because we have a capacity. We're not inherently good, and we're not inherently evil. We are inherently a balance of positive and negative. That's the human spirit. It's a perfect balance, and it needs both to grow. We can't just be good. Hmm. We have to also make mistakes, even deliberate ones, but we have to learn and then not repeat them. Hmm. Hopefully most of the mistakes we make aren't deliberate. But that is not a fault of humanity. It's a, hmm. it's a mechanism. The problem is when religions say you are sinning and you, there's a punishment for what you've just done and it's an eternal damnation and all the rest of this, and it, it's, we become enslaved by beliefs instead hmm. of by logic. Yeah. And it's, it's very difficult. If, if your audience, if someone, if you are holding a strong belief system out there, and you hear this, you're going to think it's heretical, it's uh, the Antichrist, it's demonology, all sorts of beliefs. Mm -hmm. You will be defending or attacking through beliefs rather than, well, what he's saying, simply what he's saying. I don't know if it's true or not true. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. How do I go about determining what truth is? And that's all really fundamentally what the case is saying yeah. here. It's search of knowledge. Can I get In the knowledge and then you... knowledge. Yeah, if you get the knowledge. And that will bring us to a natural peace. Hmm. And peace is not passivity. Peace is dynamic, it's evolutionary, it, it's cooperative, it's challenging. War is easy. We just give in to our lower nature, to our aggression, to our mm. fear, and we bash each other. <laughs> so that's, um, ba that's what Billy's actually doing. Um, with some of his, his uh, prophecies, though, he, he, um, if you take belief out, right, and you've got the knowledge of what he said years ago, and now it's come true, mm -hmm. It's not that he had a belief, he had the knowledge of what was being told to him, what may happen in the future. Right, and, it, and, and in all fairness, he may have been told things that he didn't know would be true, yep. but he relayed the information. He yep. never said, you have to believe this. No. Here's what it said. Type mm -hmm. it out. And, believe it or not. Or yes. observe it and observe find it. out. Same. So when you get something as uh, dire and, and heavy and dismal as much of the Enoch or Hanach prophecies are, mm. you go, oh, why would I even want to know about this if this could happen? Then, what? and this is how my own process, I looked at maybe 50 years worth of prophetically accurate information. You have to understand there's no junk in here. Mm -hmm. They laid it out and that stuff was occurring and still does and things are still being validated and corroborated. You can almost, uh, every month you're going to find two or three things. Myra was told before that uh, now are so-called new discoveries. Well, when I looked at that body of information, I said, wait a minute. What they've done here is they've given us the most amazing, most significant, unparalleled body of prophetically accurate information. That built a foundation of credibility. Mm. How, why do we believe or accept something as true? How do we know it's true? Well, if we get something and it checks out, Say, well, that's true. Now you've got a body of truthful information given before things happen. That tells me one thing primarily. It warrants my attention to look at the warnings for today and tomorrow mm -hmm. because they've proven their accuracy and they're showing their intention. Their intention is they've taken 50 or 60 years slowly to say, here's how we build our credibility. And now we give you the, the thing we're trying to warn you about specifically. Mm -hmm. So, if we as human beings have the, the wit and the wisdom, we will say, credible source, believe me, my country went to war with Iraq on one zillionth <laughs> of the validity of this, you know, com mm -hmm. comparably nothing. Yeah. Here you've got, you know, you've got 60 Sorry. some years of, you know, altogether of higher experiences. Mm -hmm. And you go, who? <laughs> Pretty solid stuff, the most diverse areas, not, you know, we know this, therefore we go to kill people. No, how about it? these details, and then they're not telling us to kill anybody. They're saying the opposite. Basically what they're saying is, and this is for our country and anybody that's allied with it, the U.S., unless the United States of America withdraws from Iraq and all military occupation around the world, it will lead to a third world war. And the place that will get the biggest destructive result of that in the world of cause and effect will be the United States. Not a cheerful message for me or my you know, fellows at home, mm -hmm. but one that they successfully ignore so far. So that's one of, um, one of the things that he's written. He, he, delivered, that he the, delivered the message. Yeah, in the Enoch or Hanak prophecies, yeah. for, they foretell the destruction of the World yeah. Trade Center. Mm -hmm. They say this is only the beginning of even worse, more catastrophic events to befall the U.S. of a, of a uh, military slash terrorist and natural disaster origin. Mm -hmm. Devastation, destruction, and annihilation at an unprecedented level never before seen on the planet will befall our country if we don't stop the policy. Mm -hmm. As a, as a um, Billy, as a human being, how does he cope with that? I mean, um, well, he mentally is knowing that these things, the messages that have been given. Well, I would say it's a few ways. Assuming that he is as integrated uh, in who he is as yeah, he uh, as appears a, to be, he's seen a lot over mm -hmm. a long period of time, mm -hmm. as have these play armed people. They don't delight in this idea. They have emotions, they have feelings. Uh, they are not uh, you know, untouched by the drama, but they cannot involve themselves. So knowing that, that humanity is moving in this direction is, is not a happy state for him. He's, mm -hmm. I've asked him, what, what else can we do? He says, just tell people to become peaceful. They're, show them the things we have to 
direct them towards that. And really, one of the core things, the new pamphlet that came out essentially uh, demonstrates and, and uh, proposes the simple premise that the wars have to first be fought inside of you. In other words, that's where the core teaching of self-responsibility comes. In this case, what they're talking about is self-responsibility. If we begin to become aware of our thoughts, our feelings, the impulses to action, and consciously notice what we're thinking, feeling, and, and doing, with education, such as is contained in this case in other places too, where there are good philosophies and teachings of moral conduct and all the rest, we will not send out thought forms of aggression. We will not allow ourselves to be stirred up into hate and blind you know, anger and rage. We will not act those things out. We will think them through. We will struggle to come through a logical position. And this is not about pacifism, mm -hmm. because they say every creature in creation has a means of defending itself because there is always aggression. There's always attack. There's always a defense. Because in the dynamic, I mean, we're talking about positive, negative, good, bad, light, dark, yin and yang, mm -hmm. you need that for life to move, but there always must be a growth, a dynamic movement towards evolution and peacefulness, but that requires protection. So if people give up their means of self-defense, it's a spiritual crime. Mm -hmm. It's not only a right to defend yourself, it's a responsibility. If a person or a people discover that somehow they have bought into pacifism and uh, we will always turn the other cheek. Then we've misunderstood because to allow yourself to be victimized is a spiritual crime. Mm. So it's very complicated. These people have weapons, they just don't attack with them. They defend with them. Mm -hmm. They loaned Meyer one of their antique beam weapons. He put a hole in a tree all the way through an apple tree. Oh, could he have drilled it? Not likely. Why not likely? Smooth as glass all the way through. Everything in a straight line into the forest is singed. When the investigators go and measure, they say, well, that's a pretty good trick with a drill, you know, <laughs> burned for as far as they could go. So mm. they defend themselves, they protect themselves because they're human beings. And it, no matter, as long as you're incarnate in some form, from a little microbe to a highly advanced human being, you have to be able to defend yourself. And that maintains their respect and, you know, necessary. But you don't go and aggress. For instance, the United States of America, my country, uh, in the last 60 years, we have aggressed... 200 plus times, well over 200 times, all unprovoked against other peoples and other countries that didn't attack us. The latest thing I just saw on the internet, uh, I think it was the FBI went and assassinated a, uh, a man in Puerto Rico. Mm. Uh, now, he might have been a controversial little fellow, but he was 72 years of age sitting around with his wife, and he surrounded his place with a SWAT team and helicopters, shot him and let him bleed to death. Well, that's not exactly a good way to go. How dangerous was that man? Hadn't attacked anybody. Uh, these policies, what, what happens is we forget one of the primary teachings that actually appears in religions usually, like mm. uh, do unto others as you would have others do unto them, and that which a man soweth, so shall he reap. It simply means the laws of cause and effect. Take away any religious overtones, and it means if you push something out, when you throw something out, there is always an opposite and equal reaction. It comes back in its own time. Mm. We in America, when we see things happening, be they natural disasters, attacks, anything else, we have to also look at the causative actions. That doesn't mean that everything that happens to you, you've you know, violated somebody or something. There's weather storms that happen and all the rest, but just like we've extracted all this petroleum and natural gas from the earth and upset the tectonic plate structure, which we were warned by the play Aaron 30 years ago, this is going to lead to volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, climate changes, you're burning down your forests, you're going to have catastrophes upon you in ever-increasing mm -hmm. frequency and intensity because of your ignorant action. So when you go out and you invade a country for so-called national interests, which aren't your business to do, sooner or later you pay the price. And if you look throughout history, there's always a leveling. One way or another, that pendulum comes back and cleans your clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. That's a big responsibility, getting that message over. Well, it's a law of physics. It shouldn't be so hard, but we don't teach this in school. We teach all sorts of mumbo-jumbo and either, mm -hmm. you know, hyper-religious or hyper-secular stuff that it doesn't accord with reality. 
don't throw it out unless you, you know, are well, willing to have it come back and hit you in the face. So if you're going to send out actions and thoughts, make them be the things that are preferred that you'd like to experience as well. So that way we create peace by treating people as, as we'd like to be treated. Mm -hmm. There will be people that will be irrational, there's no doubt. As far back as in the 50s they told Meyer, there's going to be an upsurge of religious fundamentalism, craziness coming from many parties, and it's not exclusive only to Islam, but mm -hmm. it is there. Yes. It's in Christianity, it's in Judaism, it's in Buddhism, and it's in Hinduism. It's in all of these forms that start to polarize so much, and they have the one truth, and they're going to kill you if you don't take it on. Well, you can't just sit back and let people roll over you, but you also, you don't invest in these people. You don't support them with your CIA and just try and direct them against somebody else, hoping they won't come towards you. Mm -hmm. It's complex. This is real life. There's no snapping of your fingers, but it's the, either we have the principles intact or we don't. Right now, we don't. Yeah. And, and you personally, right, you've taken on a bit of a quite a big task, getting that message out for Billy. Well, I like um, it. How, how does that impact on you? I mean, public reaction? Well, as I say, the people that I've had the most trouble with have been the UFO researchers. <laughs> Sorry the, about that. And the You're in Australia now. You should be okay. Oh, well, I don't care. I don't mind. <laughs> because, you see, it's okay. Um. You know, it, because, look, I... I haven't gone through this. Billy's the guy that's mm. gone through all this stuff. I'm a reporter. I'm a researcher. I, in a way, I don't, I don't take it personally. And if people are mad at me or at the material, I think, well, let's, let's deal with the question. Let's deal with the issue. Let's deal with the challenge. If you've got a good challenge, what you're going to make me do is work harder. If I work harder, I get in there to refine and find out, well, is, is it possibly wrong? Is there something I don't know? Or, oh, my gosh, it's opening up even more stuff. And so when you <laughs> come back to the skeptics, with this next layer of revelation that their own challenge has provoked, it's like they don't have enough fingers to stick in the dikes to plug the holes. <laughs> you know, they go, well, I'll stick my nose in it. Yeah, you did. You stuck your nose in it. Yeah. You know? So, uh, in a way, I say to people, this is the easiest thing to do. Easy in the sense that it's there. It's not filled with lies that you have to keep. Billy doesn't have to sit there and go say, oh, what did I tell you last year? You know, uh, oh, it's this. You ask him a question. If he doesn't know the answer, he says, I don't know. If he knows it, he tells you the answer. I tried to trick him as I was talking to you folks earlier. I tried to trick him with something I'd asked him a year ago. The answer was the same, boom, boom just like that. And mm -hmm. he's had quite a few conversations in a year, as we all have. He probably has had a few more. So you start to get a sense of a person's character and their truthfulness. Mm -hmm. And I consider it an honor to be able to simply report what I've found here. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I don't... You know, I don't, I don't consider myself a, some big cog in the deal. There's other people who could pick up the slack if I'm not doing this anymore. And there are people around the world now. I've had visitors from at least 80 countries to my website. And I've gotten e emails mm -hmm. from all over the world now that people that now have the DVD or the different books or the videos and stuff. And I'm going, okay, well, th the cat's out of the bag. You've, uh, you've uncorked the bottle. The genie's out there. Like that sound there, you yeah. know. So it, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a done deal, mm -hmm. and from here it'll it'll just be a. Yep. Excuse me a minute. Go. Oh. So really, what with with disseminating the information, and making it available to people, it's now it can't be stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. We may go through the changing times, either dramatically and very very painfully, or a little more elegantly, a little more gracefully. The more people that even hear about the case. You know, I'm, I'm representing this case, and I'm not saying there aren't yeah. other contributing things. But the more people that hear about the Meyer case and start to look, that realize that there's a peace meditation. Probably one of the most important things in the entire case is what's known as the Salome peace meditation, an ancient, ancient, ancient meditation that's actually performed by not only some people, not only some people here on the planet, yeah. but by 3.2 billion extraterrestrial humans on our behalf. Yeah. If we could get uh, an expanded network of people on one weekend, 20 minutes, it's, a, it's, a, it's on my website, they can look and see how to do it, they can even get from Switzerland a DVD so you can hear how it's pronounced. We could make a quantum leap in peace because what they've said is these are ancient, from the Lyran star system, ancient words that simply open the Akashic and help to, dis to dissolve some of the shroud of negativity 
around the planet from all these thought forms from thousands of years of negative thinking. And it's a Salome peace meditation. Salome Gamnam Ben Urda Ganiber Asala Esperona. It's kind of quick pronunciations, stretch out a little more than that. But this is done for 20 minutes. Yeah. And it's being done simultaneously, as I say, by these extraterrestrial humans on our behalf, but it, it can't work fully without more and more people participating here. Yeah. That put into motion is a huge thing that people can do if they sense that that's positive for them. Mm. Taking your peace symbol, remember your peace symbol from the 60s? Yeah. Turn it right side up. It's upside down. It is right now and has been for the past over 30 years, literally, we've been walking around with a symbol of death. Really? The narrow cross, the upside down the root, yeah. it's a symbol of death and militarism. It's a sword with the branches going down mm -hmm. and one thrusting thing. The peace symbol as it's meant to be, and that's shown on the website, yeah. it's a tree of life. Mm -hmm. You turn it upside down, now you see those two elements that we're pointing down are open and up. Yeah. And it's an upward energy, openness, harmony, peace, life. And a simple mechanism like that, use it Turn your peace symbols up, upside down. Feel free to take it and put it on your stationery. Start using that idea. And don't run out protesting for peace with a militant symbol. Embody mm. that symbol. Use the symbol. And don't go killing people with it, you know, beating them over the head with it. Yeah. It's not the way to do it. So a lot of this stuff I'm giving, you know, the, the Cliff Notes version of it, but it's in the case. And, and there's plenty there that gets right down to how societies need to structure what's appropriate for immigration in worlds where you still have various countries and boundaries and borders, why we should dismantle every nuclear power plant, how toxic that is, mm. the proper way to have rotations of births to limit population naturally so we don't have to have pestilence and disease and wars and we bring... You'd be so surprised. You'd go, oh, where's the UFOs? Well, that's the, that's the ships they came in. You know, like in our country, you know, Columbus arrived offshore with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Okay, great, we got the ships out of the way. Who are these guys and what are they here for? Yeah, right. In this case, okay, well, it's very dazzling and fancy UFOs. Oh, extraterrestrials, how wonderful. Well, what, is, what are you here for? That's why when people talk about so-called contact cases and what they're photographing and filming, I say, I don't even care about UFOs because I can't do anything with UFOs. I've seen them. I've seen the best UFO photos and films in the world. Okay, now what? What's the content? What do they have to offer? What piece of the puzzle are they putting on the table for us to put in place? Mm. Not what are they going to do to set us straight. I don't want anybody coming to save me again. Because <laughs> you're in trouble all over again. You know? yeah. No. What's the piece of the puzzle here? They put that one down. We've got our own. Okay, now the picture starts to come mm. into shape. Yeah. And that's, that's you know, very much what about. we're trying to do here. Yeah. It's not dramatic, it's slow. Leadership, not from the top down, from the bottom up. Exactly. One person at a time. Someone who starts to get this and discusses with those, not to teach and make people follow or get involved. If someone resonates, if they're interested and you're talking, you start to create that network, that hundredth monkey thing happens, the ripples in the pond, mm -hmm. all the different stones are dropping. Now you've got these different interference patterns that are creating a web of strength in consciousness, and that will be the foundation upon which a new world, not a new world odor, but a new world gets built. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're leaving that idea behind. Yeah. And we're beyond. We're beyond that, mm -hmm. and it's going to be very, you know, interesting the way interesting we go about it. These are people, by the way, the extraterrestrials and Marquis have calluses in their hands. Mm -hmm. They work on their own land. Mm -hmm. Now they're not dependent on that for their food. They have high, you know, agricultural. But these are people that have gotten back to the primary idea that you live somewhere and you work somewhere and you take care of life and you contribute to your society and your society contributes to you. They don't have politics anymore and they don't have money. They have high accountability. Their leaders are the most spiritually and philosophically wise people who also have to do their two hours of work every day on the planet. Mm -hmm. So you don't have hierarchies. You don't have celebrities and they're not there to accumulate wealth. How many pieces of paper do you need if you have access to a craft in which you can leave the planet and travel through the cosmos, you can learn the most amazing things, you can interact with other... What? Give me green pieces of paper or anything. You know, Australian money is very beautiful. It really is. But I'll take, the, you know, the capacity to do all this stuff. The price... I'll for, take the ride. Wouldn't you take the ride? Yeah, but yeah. the price for the ride mm. is to give up acquisitiveness and trying to accumulate the excessively unnecessary 
uh, amounts of material goods. You can have my camera then. We'll okay, start. I'm waiting for How that. So that's what this was leading to, you know. I want that camera. <laughs> you want that camera? Yeah. So, oh, well, that's amazing. And you know, they have to yeah. they have to conform to to certain order, but yeah. they have great freedom at the same time. Yeah, and um, uh, I don't doubt that tonight people will be very enlightened with your information. So I will wear a protective suit. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Michael. of time, we have asked, who are we? You know, what happened before the Big Bang, and what's going to happen after the universe ends? And pretty much, I'm going to, I'm going to present to you some possibilities. I don't have the answers. I'm just a human being, like everybody else. I, I don't think one person has the answer. I think we all have the answer. I think every single one of us in this room is sitting here because we're a part of something. And I don't know if everybody knows everybody in here, but I hope you've taken the opportunity since you've been here to, to meet your friends, because I think it is very important, and I found it's very important for myself to talk to other people and talk about your experiences, because I think that's how we find the answers. Somebody said to me one time, he who unlocks the secrets of the universe holds the keys to the future of mankind, and I, I really do believe that. So I'm Kathleen M. Anderson with an E, I was born in Connecticut. I lived in Connecticut. I'm a New Englander. Lived in Los Angeles, traveled around the country. Um, I've worked in newspaper, television, things, good things like that. Unfortunately, it doesn't pay to be a writer <laughs> in the United States. It's one of the lowest paying jobs in the country, so I do have a mortgage business, which is, is when times get economically bad in the United States, people need money. They need to keep taking more money out of their house. So that's what I do, and um, as I said, I'm here to, to just present information, not to make any conclusions. I'm trying to find the answers just like everybody else. If I say 99 things, or 100 things, and I say one thing that you haven't heard before, then maybe I've said something to help you. Um, so on June 24th, approximately 3 o'clock in 1947, a pilot by the name of Kenneth Arnold was flying, and if I'm in your way, let me know. A pilot by the name of Kenneth Arnold was flying from uh, Oregon to his home in Idaho when a glint of uh, light caught his eye. And as you probably know, all know the story, he reported nine flying objects, objects over Mount Rainier, which is 14,410 feet. The press got a hold of the story because Kenneth Arnold was part of the, the sheriff's deputy, and it started a UFO frenzy that is continuing to this day from 1947. The, uh, the name Flying Saucer came about because one of the objects that Kenneth had seen obviously was around and, looked, and skipped on the air like a flying saucer. But if we go back and say, is this the beginning of ufology? No, I don't think it's the beginning of ufology. I think ufology has been with us for a very, very long time. This is Mount Rainier. It's a very large mountain, comes out of sea level and goes up high. Uh, about three years ago, I was talking to somebody and they said, you really need to look at the history. You really need to look at history. And I said, I, I don't really want to look at history. I don't like history. History is not, geography I like. History is not one of my favorite subjects. And they said, you have to look at history because maybe the key to what's going on now is in history. Because I said, well, I want to know what they're doing here. I want to know what, with who the Greys are. Who, what's UFOs? What do they want? What's their agenda? You know, I want it right here. I'm an Aries, so you know, I tend to be impetuous. So I started start doing some digging. I've always been a Zachariah Ascension fan. But I kept going through, and I didn't grow up with the Bible, but I started to start digging into holy books, not just the, the Bible, but the Kabbalah and uh, other mythology. I'm Celtic, I'm Irish, and said, you know, maybe if we take mythology, archaeology, and these holy books, maybe they all come down to one source. And maybe the stories that we hear are have some clue to who we are, and who are we, and what's happening here. 
So, you know, we all know Ezekiel and Elijah and Moses, they've, they've had some contact with gods, and I always say gods, with little g, and that's not to offend anybody that is religious here, but there is, I do believe there was gods with little g's, because the gods with the little g's had the capacity to fly in the sky, and if you look at some of the stuff that was written, and as I said, I'm a pupil of Zachariah Sitchin. I took his last class that he held accreditation so I could teach his material. But I didn't want to be controversial. Because Zachary Sitchin, let's face it, is a man. He's just like everybody else. What does he know? I mean, he's just going to interpret everything. So I started doing a lot of research at, Ox at o the cuneiform writings of Oxford University, University of Pennsylvania, and University of Chicago and said, how do the scholars look at what happened in the past? And who are these gods? What were they flying in? You know, what were they doing up there? So we go down and we realize when we start looking at the commonality of stories that the gods have the same characteristics as we do. I mean, they're very similar. They had two arms, two legs. And that they have the same characteristics that we do. You know, they experienced love, the Inanna thing. <laughs> love and hate and war. They, they were jealous, they ate, they had sex, and they drank beer. They liked all the indulgences that we do as, as humans do. Now, a lot of people see these, the, the depictions that are sitting in Iraq right now, and isn't that funny? I, you know, we talk about kind of the coincidence. It says to me, well, the Mesopotamian Valley is some of the oldest in the world, and yet the United States has chosen to go over there and have a war. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was always, my biggest thing was, I, I, I was, well, wait a minute here. What's going on there? <laughs> There's some wonderful artifacts that could be lost through this whole thing. So a lot of people think that the big, you know, I come across people and they say, the, um, they think that basically from the writings we've had from Sumerians, that these are, the Sumerians are the big, tall, bearded beings that were there. And they're not, of course. Those are the Assyrians and the Babylonians. The Sumerians sprang into the Mesopotamian Valley about 5000 BC. No one knows where they came from. If you look at mainstream archaeology, they don't know. Some people say they came from the sea. So um, pretty much what we do know from archaeology in Oxford University, University of Pennsylvania, and Chicago, not Zachariah Sitchin, is that they came with them and brought us a culture. They actually gave us the wheel, astronomy, astrology, um, how to build roads, how to harvest grains, everything that man would know to survive. And they also brought with us very, very interesting stories, including one tale of Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh, as probably everybody knows, if you read it, please, if you can find a copy of the Book of Enoch, read it and find out that there's, if you take that basis of what was left to us in writing, our first forms of writing later became things that we interpret in the Bible. There's a game when you're a child in the United States called uh, Telephone. And Telephone is that Somebody tells a story here, and that person passes it down, and they call, and they call, and they call, and they call. By the time we started with this story, and by the time we end up with this story, it has a lot of interpretation and meaning. And that's pretty much how I feel about what's happened to anything we read. It's interpretation of man. And let's face it, I'm a writer, and I know that when I write something, you put a little bit of your own ego in there. So you say, what is the Anano what, is, what does Sumerians have to do with UFOs? I think they have a lot to do with UFOs. Because they left us a tale of gods, little g gods, that were in the sky and they could fly. They came down from the heavens. As we know with Ezekiel, they came with the fiery chariots, the, chariots, the wheels. Um, there's a good book out. I don't know if you can even find it anymore. I think it's called The Gemini Project. It's a really rare book. Maybe Bill Chucker has that in his library. It was written by a, a Gemini engineer who actually took apart a, the Bible. And he, he was a designer of one of the Gemini projects for NASA and said that there were so many commonalities in how to build a rocket that go into space versus what you see in the Bible. You just have to look. So what they left us, the Sumerians, they told us a tale of the Anunnaki. 
And somebody brought a good point up a couple of years ago, and they said the Anunnaki were actually the givers of life. They were the they were the gods that gave us life, that created us. And we all know that the Egyptians had the Ankh. Well, Egyptians don't say Ankh. They and Ankh is A N K H. Anunnaki. So if you look at Anunnaki, who are the Egyptians talking about? The Anunnaki that gave us life, because that's what the Ankh is, key of life. So you say, okay, what does this have to do about UFOs? Well, we still have gods in the sky. Oops, I just want to see if you're awake. <laughs> There's my, the back of my Australian cattle dog, can do, and horses. I'm a horse person. <laughs> So we go on from the Sumerians, because if you remember, if you listen to the tales of the Sumerians, they told about that the gods were here. Why were the gods here? They were here, they came to visit, they had a, a crew of workers, they were here for gold, they were processing gold. If you look at, a lot of you probably read about monatomic gold, and people are always in search of monatomic gold, which the gods had, which they had converted gold into powder and they ingested and it opened their uh, penile gland and made them radiant and uh, if you listen to the story of Noah, he was born with very radiant eyes and his father, Lamech, is it? Uh, thought, wait, wait a minute here, he must be part God. So we move on to the story of the how we were created and we, we, we up, we're coming up to the future here and we look at whatever evidence we have in the United States right now, and we have what we call glyphs, petroglyphs that are around the country. This is in Washington State, and of course the Native Americans say the same story. Actually, their story in most of Western Washington, Native Americans say that we were, uh, we, they actually came from a big shell in the sky. And uh, the shell landed and all these people, little people came out. So you think, hmm. Now, I'm curious about this photo because I'd like to know if it corresponds with anything that's in Australia. No, yes, maybe. These are on the Columbia River. And I talked about how the Anunnaki were supposedly, if you listen to the Sumerians, talked about the Anunnaki were gods from heaven that basically ingested gold and could have a radiant, they had radiant uh, rays coming off of them. So I started doing some research about, these are petroglyphs on the Columbia River, and if you always notice in, in the United States, you'll see a lot of our old petroglyphs have these radiant beings. And you know, if you look at archaeologists, they say, oh, because they were gods. And I go, what does that have to do with No, I, I don't understand the connection. Um, and bouncing down to the Anasazi, I went down there about mm, 10 years ago, no, less than 10 years ago. And I went on a tour of all the Pueblos and everything like that, and they said, oh, the Anasazi, they disappeared, and they used to wear these clothes over here, and they had all the sophisticated plumbing, and these kivas, and they had a religion and everything. And then they ran out in the desert and they lived in a tent. And I go, well, that doesn't make sense. Why would they have all the sophisticated stuff? And why would they go be living in a teepee after that? It, so I said to the ranger, I said, well, how do you know what they look like if you don't have any skeletons? And he said, it's all hypothesis. I said, that makes no more sense. You're just, you're just conjuring up what you think, archaeologists. No, no blast on archaeologists here, but you're only, you're only saying that you know, this, this is logical. So I've never been a person that would you know, take what somebody tells me as gospel. Now going back to Washington State, because I'm going to cut this down really short, uh, the Yakima Reservation, I don't know if a lot of people have heard about Mount Adams, Yakima Reservation. It's a very mysterious place in Washington State. Uh, for years and years and years, we've had earth lights. Paul Devereaux has done a lot of uh, research there, Greg Long. We don't know what goes on there. There's 125,000 acres of wilderness that you can't get into. There's a lot of rumblings underground, there's earth flight, there's things that look like spaceships coming out of remote areas that nobody could pop, you know, big cities coming out of the ground, columns of light, fires that look like fires, <laughs> really weird sounds, Bigfoot sightings, and we're talking about, we'll jump to Bigfoot Valley. 
uh, one of the recent cases that I have. And, you know, Travis, um, you have the courage to get up here on stage, but, you know, as a researcher, and I'm state director for MUFON for Washington State and also on the board of MUFON, a lot of people just never do come to us. And when they come to us, they don't give us their permission to tell their story. But if you look at the commonality, I have never seen a UFO. I don't know, probably everybody in this room has seen a UFO. I can find out the commonality is that there's a lot of information, Bill Chalker probably knows this, and Roger, a lot of information that actually comes up in cases that we can't divulge, number one. And number two, there's just too much in common with other people. You know, that doesn't make sense. You go, how did this person have the same information as this person? So one of the cases I just did recently is in the Bigfoot Valley. I don't know how the Bigfoot Valley got its name. Nobody's ever seen a Bigfoot. But there was a couple looking out in bed, and they saw this mountain. And down comes uh, one sphere, but I kind of had to put it in the direction. And it comes, shoots down, and then shoots back up again. And I'm bringing up the sphere because in the United States, a lot of our sightings right now are more globe-type, golden spheres, which was a sign of, I think, talk <laughs> when you come right down to it. Um, if you look, this comes from the National UFO Reporting Center, and Peter Davenport would be very upset with me if I didn't tell you to go get his brochure out that I put on the table there in his business card and uh, check out his website. But we're getting a, an awful lot of this over the past, um, especially the past year. And if you think about aviation, I'm not a pilot, that if you're going to develop some kind of flying machine to go around, I guess this, uh, a, a round globe would be the perfect, perfect thing to, uh, to get around in. You wouldn't have to go forward or backwards easily. We had another golden orb that came. Um, I had to use that graphic, <laughs> but uh, come down. We've had a couple of them in Washington State now. I, I don't know what's going on. I, I really don't, but I know something is going on. Uh, another re lot of reports that we get is uh, Iridium satellites. I don't know if you get Iridium satellites here, do you? They basically go across and then they flare up when they catch the suns. We get a lot of reports from there. So we go back to Travis's experience and everybody else's experience and you say, what is going on here? You know, and I heard somebody actually mention about Travis's nationality. Um, I'm a big fan of Sir Lawrence Gardner also. And you look at, you know, what could be possible? What If there was a civilization of gods, and they had to leave the planet, which they did, we know, they had to leave. Unfortunately, man took over, kind of made a whole mess of things, changed things. So did they leave behind possibly the watchers? And what are they watching for? What are they looking for? Um, Travis and I were talking about DNA, and we were saying that, you know, we're just finding out so many things about DNA now, what are they going to find out? Like, uh, they're saying there's so many strands in the DNA chain that don't mean anything. And we all agreed, and Jerry was saying, do they really not mean anything, or do they really, we just don't understand what they mean. And is everybody in here, and this sounds, well, this sounds horrible, but, is everybody in here possibly in here for a reason? Maybe you're not out watching rugby or football. Maybe you're in here because you're a descendant of something that was here. And maybe you are being monitored. And that's how we look at it at MUFON. We're finding out there were some statistics we just released. And uh, I don't know if you're going to read about them too, too much unless you get the MUFON journal. And over all the years that we've done cases, we have found that on the abduction scenario, there's actually three types of situations. There's people that actually participate, participate. There's people that are willing participants. There's people, I have had dreams about this, so that's why it's kind of creepy in a sense. There's actually people that um, help other people. Like, come on, <laughs> come over here. And there's people that go unwillingly or don't understand that they're part of it. And so we have to question, is part of the whole abduction a DNA study? Are we being watched? Are we descendants? There is a high amount of Celtic people and Celtic backgrounds that do fall under abductions. I don't know why, but that's a fact. That's an absolute fact.
There is statistics, I can't mention them because if I start mentioning them, I may offend certain groups, but there is, there is information. Uh, MUFON, we're not, in the United States, we're not going to be having meetings so much anymore. We're actually more of a publishing company from, from here on in over the next year. They have all the database for APRO and MUFON since the 50s. All those things are being archived and they will be online. And MUFON will be selling that time to go back to every case that we have. They have something like 1.2 million pages of reports that will be available to the public. It's not a big, big hole like everybody thinks. So the, in conclusion, um, you know, where, where, do we, where does this all fall? Where do they come from? Okay, so if there is aliens or whatever, where do they come from? Time travel. Um, the one commonality I was talking to Travis about was um, about two years ago, a, a scientist by the name of Lujan Wang used particles and got them beyond the speed of light by using ra a form of radon gas. In the Bigfoot Valley, there's large deposits of uranium and radon gas. Travis was saying that there is ra um, radon gas, not radon gas, but there's uranium up in your mountains too. So you have to think possible, okay, here's a possibility. Could whatever is coming into our system or wherever they're coming from possibly be able to, are they using radon gas to go beyond the speed of light? Rudy Rucker, a physicist in the 1980s said that if you were, his theory was, and he didn't write about UFOs, he's writing about physics. If you were living on level one, you may not know there's a level five if you didn't have a way to get there. So possibly life is a lot more complex and a little more multi-dimensional than we'd like to say. I did an interview with Michio Kaku a couple years ago, and of course his theory is that everything moves, everything is vibrating in content, continual perpetual mo motion in the space. If you might be a C string, you might not know there's a D string next to you. Mm -hmm. If you were broadcasting on 101.1, you might not know there's life at 98.5. Which makes a lot more sense. Uh, we go back to John Mack. Our experiences that people have internal. Are, is the mind so powerful that we can actually create things? I'm a firm believer in that. Um, when we talked about the Sumerians coming from the ocean, did they come from civilizations that were lost? And maybe these civilizations like Atlantis or whatever, maybe they did exist. I'm a firm believer that the Earth is a lot older, civilization is a lot older than we, we do. Or the last thing is life more just, just all of the above. It's more complex than we could ever imagine. There's an article in May issue of Scientific American that says, if you haven't read the article, it's really good. And it says that after the Big Bang, scientists are now saying that possibly we formed in parallel universes. And if you look at some of the ancients, they're trying to tell us about geometry, sacred geometry, mathematics, maybe is the key to where we come from. It's a really good article. And basically, maybe they were trying to say that if these balls were in perpetual motion, and this was our universe, and this was the next universe, and these maybe you, they don't always simultaneously are not next to each other. So it, it's not a light year thing. It's possibly a wormhole time, a way to, to get over the time. And there we are. Kenneth Arnold, before he died, said, and he didn't want that experience. Um, he, he was very, he said, I, if I had to do this over again, I would never do this again. I would never have told anybody about these UFOs. But he basically said, in my experience, that everyone, no matter what part they play in our existence, has a special purpose, a special task, or a special reason for being what they are and what they are doing. Perhaps it is a personal reason, merely to add to your own experience, our mental growth, our ability to become a functional part of society, which may be far more vast than you dream. And I am a firm believer of that. I think everybody in this room basically is a part of something. And I think that's why it's so good to, to be here and exchange ideas. My analogy to people that are skeptics, you know, not, a, not us in here, because we're all, I think we're here for a reason. But I tell people, until we invented the microscope, we didn't know there was a whole universe of microscopic things. And, if you've never seen a parasite or something under the microscope, you have to take it, you have to take it for granted that something does exist. So I don't know why there's skeptics out there and say, when they say something doesn't exist, because things do exist. 
Until we invented the telescope, we couldn't see that there was universes far beyond our eyesight. So I have to say, you know, I just tell people, just because you can't see it, taste it, or uh, smell it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Things do exist. And I think that when we find, we'll find a way maybe to see that maybe life is all around us. Maybe we're interacting in this room with a whole other dimension that is going the same time we do. Maybe planets, there is life on there. We just can't, we just can't see them. And with that, I'd just like to say,